All right, I'm going to make this smaller for a moment. Okay, uh, we are on. Uh, welcome everyone to tonight's episode of Profound States. I'm your guest, as all uh, guest, your, your host, as always, Mike. I'll get it here in a second. And my guest is Nancy Duterte. Uh, I'm not going to read her bio because it's like I'll be here all day. <laughs> I don't think so. She's uh, uh, have a has a bachelor of arts, magna cum laude from Princeton, uh, in the Romance languages. Yeah, uh, I'm not sure what those are. Uh, uh, what's a JD? JD is a Juris Doctor. Juris Doctor. That that's a, a degree that you get when you become a lawyer. So is that like a PhD, but the, the, a doctor? I mean, the, I, the you know, version? I asked I asked a lot of people that question. I thought maybe it was like a master's, and I've tried. So it's sort of it, since you can do it right after college. I I think it's more like a master's than it is a PhD. Okay. You can get a PhD in certain types of law. So I'm going to say it's like a master's. Well, she is, uh, let's see here. I'll try to read this without going too slow. Uh, she was trained by Lynn Buchanan, who I've been uh, scheduling on the show a couple of times. We haven't quite connected yet, but hopefully we will. I got a lot of questions to ask him. Um, so how long you, did you train with him? I trained up to sort of early advanced level with him. Well, how long so does that take? I, I went down to Almogordo a few times. And, how long uh, does it take to get to advanced level with his version of remote viewing? Uh, I mean, pretty fast, actually. It? Yeah, it's fast compared to the way I'm teaching my own version of uh, remote viewing these days. Yeah. She trained with uh, Marty Rosenblatt, Applied Precognition Project, and, and remote viewing also. Uh, Angela Thompson, I'm from, I know of her. I, I can't remember who she is, anything other than I do remember her name very much. Um, She's Paul Smith's former sister-in-law. Well, I know who she Paul will, Smith she, is. I know Paul Smith is another remote viewer. Right. That's her sister-in-law? Former sister-in-law. She works with him a lot now. Or okay. she has, yeah. And uh, you apprenticed for nearly a decade uh, with Nancy Weber. And I've seen many a number of shows with her solving, talking yeah. about her solving various crimes. Uh, so she's uh, familiar also. Uh, you trained more than two decades with Reverend Barbara Tool in media and spiritual mediumship. So you are a medium, yes? Yes. Okay, and what does that mean other than it's between large and small? <laughs> 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 well, what is a medium? Uh, let's see. Now you got me off track. A medium, uh, essentially, you know, they say, you, you know, the expression, I'm sure you do, that uh, it's an old expression among people who are rather sh psychically inclined, that um, all mediums are psychic, but not all psychics are mediums. All mediums are psychic, but not all psychics are mediums. Uh... Right. Well, meaning, meaning, in effect, that when you're, if I'm drawing off in, information off of your essence, let's say your aura, your, I'm reading into you, whatever it is I'm doing, that's a very, that's psychic, okay. But if I'm communicating with spirit, that's something that's a little more, uh, let's say, difficult or, or in some way sort of elevated. It's just more difficult. It's less immediate. Um, in terms of gathering information. So do you're not a channeler? I refuse to channel. Okay, so you you let the me the spirit speak to you and you reply to the customer what they're saying. Correct. Okay, now I understand. You, you're like um, uh, there's a, two or three of those people on TV, at least uh, at least three or four I can think of. What's the lady with the uh, New York? Uh, oh, the Long Island Media. No, I wasn't thinking of her. I was thinking of, uh, I mean, I was thinking of her originally. 
I mean, when when we first thought of this, I was thinking of her. You're right. But I was just now. I was thinking of the Dead Files. Um, oh, the, uh, you know, I never really watched the Dead Files, but I, I think I know who you're talking about. Yeah, her her associate is a retired New York City detective. Yeah, yeah, yeah. His I've name I can't I can't rem- I can't pronounce his name, and uh, her name is oh God. Anyway, I met it's her not... once a long time ago, and I know who you're talking about. Okay, so uh, who else? What else have I got here? Uh, you train in Russia for two weeks uh, with psychokinesis. Yeah, I train in uh, Uzbekistan <laughs> for uh, in Russian for almost a year for about a year and. Can only remember Minyazavut uh, Mikhail Kakmasavut. That's uh, my name is uh, Michael in Russian, and what's your name in Russian? I, I remember maybe two other phrases, and that's about it. Nice. Uh, the lady who taught me was the translator for the base commander, or, or the I shouldn't say the base commander. He was the highest ranking officer on the base. He had he outranked the base commander. He was a full bird colonel on, in the Air Force. The base commander was a lieutenant colonel in the Army. Uh, so anyway, that was, um, what else? You've owned and operated a 242-bed nursing home, Brooklyn? Yeah. Those, that's like a hospice? No, it was a. It was actually a half what they used to call a health-related facility, which is for fully ambulatory patients, and then the other half was skilled nursing, which is really when they can't get out of bed, they can't move too much, and uh, but no, not hospice, not not end of life. It was it was not looked at that way at all. Okay, so you're also an attorney. Yeah. Uh, you have your law, law license currently. Yep. So I can't I can't piss you off really bad because you'll sue me into the ground. <laughs> no, I wouldn't do that. Uh, you're a psychic teacher. Uh, you taught mediumship skills in New York City, New York State, and New Jersey. Uh, I guess being as who you are, you would know where the largest banks in the U.S. have their residency. Most of them. Are in a particular city near where you taught or in where you taught. Which city is that? It's very close to New York, but is not in the same know. state. I don't know. Jersey City is the location for the biggest banks. Uh, their, their corporate office, all the biggest corporate offices of any, the largest banks are all in Jersey City. And the reason why. It's the closest place to Wall Street outside of New York City. So you just go across the water, you're in a cheaper state, and you're very close to Wall Street. Well, and it used to be one of the most bohemian places to live and the cheapest in New Jersey, which is the most expensive state to live in in terms of taxes in the country, except that Jersey City has now become the most expensive place in New Jersey. The most what? Because it, it, it's the most expen- expensive place to live, pretty much, these days. Um, because It became a really hot sort of commodity, so everybody's moving there. Well, I, I know that Deutsche Bank's U.S. corporate is there. I know that Bank of America's corporate is there. And I don't know about the others. Those are the ones I'm familiar with. Uh, I think... Wells Fargo's is in California. I don't know. Mm-hmm. There's I, I keep getting confused over where their corporate's at. Uh, hot leads, cold cases. That was your show. Correct. That was uh, I had a CBS radio show for about four years. I hosted it. I created it. I interviewed some of the most fascinating people. I think you know that I ever could have dreamed about speaking to all different types. And you wrote 
of the two books you wrote, the one that sounds most interesting, not it, not that it is the most interesting, but the one that sounds just from the title is How to Talk to an Alien. That sounds like a very fascinating book. Tell, tell the um, audience in a nutshell, <laughs> well, got... how do you talk to an alien? Yes, and I, I think my first sentence in there, I can't remember what it is, it's uh, something like very carefully. Well, uh, <laughs> well, since they could take you away and not bring you back, you really don't want to piss them off. <laughs> that was the idea, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, um, but yeah, no, actually, I think um, the the most feedback I've gotten, interestingly enough, is uh, more on the psychic intuition, uh, which is a book that I wrote a while back and explain or I attempt to explain psychic ability in terms of neuroscience, psychology, and linguistics. And people really have responded very, very well to that. They like the other one, too, How to Talk to an Alien. Uh, but it requires... I, I seem to write about things uh, uh, in advance of when they're just hitting that, you know, cusp of become, riding the popular wave. So... Uh, People have to get used to the ideas of the things I'm writing about. You're you're disappearing there. No, that's okay. I had, I'm trying to set my light where it's not uh, overly bright on my face. I'm a. I worked in the movie industry uh, off and on for about 12 years or more, 15 years, something like that. And I uh, have a degree in broadcast video production, so lighting is. You know, I'm very particular about lighting. Your lighting is perfect, and mine is like uh, still too bright, but it's it's uh, better than it was. And I probably should adjust it a tiny bit more. It's I'm very particular about lighting. Uh, it's just like it's like a legal degree. There we go. That's probably close to being accurate. Um, it's like your law stuff. Uh, um, if you don't get every single little T crossed and I dotted, um, it doesn't, it has no legal standing, right? That's to be perfect. <laughs> you forgot to cross well, this T, therefore it's invalid, right? It can change everything, yeah. <laughs> um, so, uh, tell us, I, I was listening to you on some show, I don't remember the show. And I don't remember the subject, but if I asked you to be on my show, I must have found you fascinating because I don't just ask anybody to be on the show. Usually it's somebody who has um, something that's extremely interesting. And I guess if you know, uh, tell us about how to talk to an alien. How, how, how did you even come about the idea of writing such a book? I mean, are you an experiencer, a contactee, abductee, anything? Uh, have you what, what experiences? I need to step back about five or six questions. Um, <laughs> let's 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 go back to the very beginning. What's the has anything ever happened to you that was strange, paranormal, psychic, alien, anything? In oh, your sure. life? Well, all okay. all of the above. All right. So go to the very big first thing that happened to you that was. was uh, is my line too blue, or is, what? What is going on here? It is a it is a little blue, but it's bringing out. Uh, you got some good color there. You think it's it, okay? Yeah, I think it's fine. All right. So go to go to the very first strange thing that happened to you in your life, and recall that, if you will, please. Okay. Well. Uh, okay. Now I have to back up a little bit, also, which is just to explain to your listeners that. I was never psychic, as far as I knew. It did not exist in my world. My okay. parents thought psychiatrists were woo-woo, okay? Which means anything that was truly woo-woo was completely, you know, not acknowledged. Yes, you just went blue. Oh, the lighting is changing. Yes, it is. Oh, that is weird. That's what happens when you get a $4 uh, ring light. I thought it was 14 What's that? I thought it was 14. That's what I said. Oh, I heard four. <laughs> no, no, it's 14. Don't don't take out my $10. <laughs> <laughs> I 
<laughs> All right, so let's see what we can do here. That brings it down to where it's a little less of a. Uh, so if it changes, yeah, it is altering. That's weird. It's changing. Yeah. I wonder why it's doing that. What do you think? Well, if it's listen, my experience. Uh, I've had many, many, many high strangeness things happen with electronics, so it doesn't surprise me at all if it is. Well, go ahead uh, while I play with my lighting. Go okay. ahead. <laughs> now and, you got uh, some color on half your face. That's good. Go ahead and relate your first strange experience. Okay, so so I was not psychic. Uh, I had no. I wasn't one of those gifted, you know, kids who grew up in a, uh, you know, uh, a warm and fuzzy environment of supporting of these kinds of things at all. My family was highly academic. This stuff didn't exist. We never discussed it. There's nobody in my family who is in any way psychic. And now you're in the dark. Oh, that's because my uh, TV went uh, uh, went into um, it went into save the screen mode or whatever you want to call that. So, okay. Uh, that's okay. I just need to bump this thing up. It's going there. We go. Maximum volume. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you know, whatever, whatever works. It doesn't really matter. Okay, now we're back I mean, to something. <laughs> <laughs> you could do like a, you could, you could do like a horror movie, maybe. <laughs> there you go. Perfect. Uh, it's very dark. <laughs> You know, I think about changing the volume. I'm changing the color instead of the volume. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I know somebody. Well, you know that that's a hallucinogenic story, but uh, somebody <laughs> I know who was driving into the Lincoln Tunnel didn't realize that he had been dosed with uh, some LSD and began to rip the inside of the Lincoln Tunnel began to spin and move. And so in order to uh, roll up the windows, he began pushing the, or turning the volume knob on his radio. So the music got louder and louder and louder and nothing happened with the windows. Anyway, um, so, so when I was 13, I was over at a girlfriend's house and we were, they lived in a big old house. And at that time I was not allowed to watch TV. So I wasn't familiar with TV programs or any of that kind of stuff. Listen, I'm very old. So, so not as old as me. Oh, I think so. At any rate. So, um, we're talking about ghosts upstairs in her bedroom and we're sort of, you know, having that little sort of preteen, woo, scary ghosts, you know, and having a great conversation. We get called down for dinner by her mother and her mother, her father and her little brother were all sitting in this room next to the kitchen watching uh, the TV. I hadn't, I mean, I didn't know any of the programs. We sit down in front of the TV and you're back again. Yeah. I finally found the volume. <laughs> <That's good. laughs> I kept thinking the top one was turning it off. It wasn't. It was the volume. Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. So we're in the we're in this room. We're we're eating our dinner. We're watching TV, and suddenly this woman comes out, dressed in a little maid's uh, costume. And I, for whatever reason, instantly knew what she was going to say, which was something like, it was something stupid, completely stupid, like, and now I'm going to cook a chicken, you know, and then she explains and it was silly. And I, but being, I have a sort of a little bit of an analytic mind. And I said to myself, well, 
how is that even possible that I could know what somebody was going to say in advance? Clearly, I've never seen in these TV shows. I mean, I'm not allowed to watch TV. So how could I have known that? So I then I tried to go through every you know logical thing that I could, like I said to her family members, you know, were you just talking about it? No, no, no. And then my friend said, well, you know, my father and my brother were talking about this show, but it was several hours uh, before you got here in the afternoon. So that was sort of that weird, just weird, okay? The only other weird thing is that I can remember a conversation from when I was 15 and I was with a group of my teenage friends and we're sitting around and we're talking about ghosts. And I said, well, what about if they're here? They're all around us right now and they're here. And I never forgot that. It's another one of those stupid things that you say, you know, in passing and you think that it's gone. But as I've gotten older, and I've gone on many paranormal investigations around the country. I've done mediumship work for people all over the world. And I um, have uh, seen, smelled, been touched by, heard spirit um, with my physical senses, as well as connecting with them uh, accurately on, on a more mental level. I know that we are surrounded. We are totally surrounded all the time. So I said something that was fairly stupid at the time, and yet I think it's turned out to be completely accurate. So those are the only two things that ever happened until I was in my, you know, mid-30s. And then I had a full-blown mediumship experience. And even then I said, well, what the heck was that? And I ignored it. When you say, go ahead, tell the audience your story, your full-blown mediumship story. What oh. happened? Okay. There's nothing off limits in this show. Everything <laughs> is on. Everything is available. You know, when you do when you do uh, broadcast work, you you realize that there are certain appropriate pauses and and spaces and you know whatever the other person needs in order to say what they want to say. So that's all I'm trying to manifest. At any rate, so so I was in New York. I was an attorney. I got invited very specially to join a uh, intuitive um, Gestalt psychotherapy group. Uh, they were these are all people training to be psychotherapists, and I was the only non psychotherapist there. Right. And. Uh, uh the the guy who was leading was a guy named uh, Dr. Ron D'Angelo, um, who I spent then training more than 20 years with, worth of doing intuitive gestalt psychotherapeutic work. Um, uh, but at that point, uh, you know, and I was in no way interested in doing psychotherapy. I was just I don't, I don't even know why I was doing this. Uh, but he had a really interesting take on uh, how we communicate. And so what he would do is he would set up situations where there would be sort of one person on the hot seat. They would be completely silent. You wouldn't know who they were. They'd be one, usually a person out of the group. And um, he would ask questions like if this if this person were an animal. What type of animal? What do they look like? Um, you know, what what does their environment look like? What are their needs? What do they eat? Where's their family? You know, he just asks a whole bunch of silly questions like that. And he, everyone would think their answer. You wouldn't share it yet. You'd only share it at the end. And what was happening, or he'd say, you know, if they were a cartoon character, who would they be? Or crazy stuff. And at the end, he'd go around and say, okay, what was your answer to that question and that one and that one? And what was happening was really extraordinary because what I was discovering, everybody else was too, that um, not only were people coming up with really similar answers, but in many cases you get a, a whole string of identical answers. And it's almost like the information was floating around in the air. 
And that's what he was trying to teach us about intuition. Um, and that was sort of the inspiration for my starting work on my book on psychic intuition, which I thought was just going to be a plain old book about it, um, the psychology of intuition, which didn't exist. So his um, teaching, his teaching was the beginning of your book. Yeah. Yeah. And then was that that was the beginning of your understand of your own learning in that yeah. area? Yeah. But what happened during the course of that, that one of these sessions was there was an Indian woman from India, long black hair. She sat there. He did his thing, asked us the crazy questions. We all came up with our answers. And at the end, he said, you know, she got to give a very tiny, tiny little reveal about, you know, what was what felt sort of accurate about whatever. And uh, all of a sudden, as I'm sitting there, because there was only maybe three feet, four feet between me and her in this circle, uh, I felt a very cold breeze on my forearm and it moved and it moved to the, from my right forearm, and then it was staying on my left side. And uh, I felt like I was, like someone was pushing me in my sh behind my shoulder saying, do it, do it, do it. And I'm saying to myself, hell no, I'm not, no, do it. And I was sort of being pushed. And I'm like, what the heck? Never had that in my life. And I finally, I said to, uh, Dr. D'Angelo, I said, listen, excuse me, because he was wrapping up. He said, OK, see you next month or whatever. And I said, excuse me, but uh, do you mind if I ask uh, the, the, this lady here a, a question? And he said, no, yeah, go ahead. And I said, you're not going to like it, because I knew he didn't like anything to do with psychic. And suddenly I was being pushed into something that f seemed like it was going to be psychic. So I said to her, um, do you know somebody named uh, Mary Maria Marie? Well, I don't really know. Oh, oh, forget it, forget it. No, no, why? I said, okay. Do you know somebody named either Mary Maria Marie, last name starting with letter S? And she's thinking and thinking. She said, well, I, I, I might have had a secretary a long time ago. I said, no, 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 forget it. I'm so sorry. And I felt like an idiot really an idiot because I'm not used to saying things that I can't back up and uh, she said well why and then I realized I'm going to have to tell her something that's probably certifiably crazy in front of a group of psychotherapists so I said well look I I just felt I felt a cool breeze on my right arm and whatever that breeze is it's standing in front of you and it's looking at you and um, I sort of thought it was your, maybe your mother. And uh, she, her, her eyes got really big. She starts crying. She's sobbing. And I'm thinking, oh, God, what have I done? And she said, no. She said, that was my, that was my mother's sister. And her name was. Marie, some long Indian name starting with the letter S. And I was thinking, anybody Indian, how how stupid could I be? Indian, that Maria Marie? No, that's not an Indian name. But in fact, that was her mother's, her aunt's name. And um, she said she just passed away in England uh, last month, and I wasn't able to go to the funeral. And I said, oh, and then I'm getting that, uh, like someone's pushing me again. And I said, well, and I say what I assume is the stupidest thing on earth, which is I said, well, she's standing right here and she just wants you to know that she loves you. And I thought, I thought, because I had no experience with this. I didn't know that a cool breeze is typical of a spirit. I know that now from doing tons of uh, paranormal investigations. Sure. I know that, but that didn't exist back then. They didn't have mediumship shows on TV back then. It was a long time ago. I didn't know about this stuff. I didn't know that the if you listen to any of, of the major or minor mediums saying one of the key things that they will almost always communicate is love from the other side, because that's the most important thing that you can communicate. But I didn't know that. So 
I, I, it's been a, it's been a slow road. I'm a very slow learner. Uh, yeah, I think we're all slow learners. You're not, you're in a crowd, a good crowd. So, so let's forward to uh, aliens. What, what was your first experience? You said you had all of the above. So what kind of alien experiences? Give us the first alien experience you had, if any. Okay, well, let me put it this way. As far as I know, I have never, ever been abducted, nor have I been on a craft, although many people from many different walks of life have claimed to have seen me on craft. So what do I know? That's the first thing. Second thing is I'm not one of those people. I did not see spirits walking around when I was in a crib. I I wasn't, I wouldn't. There have not been, you know, any large-eyed critters, you know, wandering around my bedroom. Um, nothing like that, okay? I know plenty of people who've had very, very serious encounters on, on those lines. I know many, many, many experiencers. Um, um, I didn't, again, take anything very seriously. The first thing that now in retrospect I do wonder about is I was in France. I was driving up from um, uh, Saint-Tropez. I was up around Lyon and then taking, uh, I was with my husband. We took, in, uh, uh, you know, what do you call it? A left turn to head towards uh, Limoges. And it's all very, very dark, dark, dark. There are no street lights. There's no nothing. There are little tiny itty bitty roads with street signs that you can't even read. And uh, we drove for hours. So we were well into our, I don't know, 10th hour, I guess. It was around four in the morning. And I said to my husband, what is, it? there's something really weird happening. The moon is following us. So it was, <laughs> so, and, of course, once again, I feel like an idiot. Um, and he is trying to look while he's driving. I'm telling him to keep his eyes on the road. Meanwhile, I'm watching every time we turn, the moon is following us, uh, the full moon. And so we, this happens for quite a bit until finally, and I was a little bit freaked out. Uh, we make a turn and we see another car and the moon is now no longer following us. So the next day we get up, we're having breakfast with his French brothers, and um, they <laughs> they say, well, you know, how was the trip back? Well, uh, my husband said, well, Nancy saw an OVNI, a uh, UFO. And uh, so they thought that was hilarious. So I said, well, look, call up the, uh, the police around that area and find out, you know, then we'll know. So they call up the police, or maybe they called up on my behalf, and uh, they were. We were told that no, no, no. There was no UFO. There's. It was the. They were having an opening of a nightclub on the other side of the the this huge lake. So that was one of those things with spinning um, uh, beams of light. You know that they do for grand openings of things. I know that wasn't it. That was definitely not it. Anyway, in retrospect, so so everybody laughed at me. That became. I became the the uh, the butt that of is, many jokes in right. France. Sure. Uh, but then uh, in 2011, June, I think it's June 19th, my daughter and I were in New Jersey. We go to Parsippany, which is one of the largest cities in uh, New Jersey. It's only a half hour outside the city, New York City. And uh, we go to our local movie theater five minutes from our house, which is set in a very large mall. OK. Um, and we go to see Woody Allen's Midnight in Paris which is important because as I, well, I'll tell you that later. Uh, at any rate, we walk out of the movie at roughly, it was 1140 at night on a Tuesday, I think. It was either Monday or Tuesday. Anyway, um, and there's nobody there. I mean, really nobody there. Like I've never seen that movie theater ever empty. There wasn't even a worker there that I, that I could recall. And it was odd. There was something weird. We go out into the uh, parking lot. There are hardly any cars. And you, it's, you know, because it's a huge parking lot, you can see well up into the sky. And That's my nice. daughter. 
and patios. Okay. Hold on a second. Hold on a second. Take a break. I'll be right back. Okay. All right. Right. Sorry about that. It's okay. Everything all right? Yeah, the wife, when she wants something, she doesn't. Uh, she's a serious individual. <laughs> I got that impression. You'll have to. Uh, I don't know what your psychic intuition is picking up. But we'll find out if you. Uh, I already picked that up before we started this. So, 
All right. Well, since you've brought it up, what uh, what do you think about her? <laughs> no, no, no. It doesn't work like that. Oh, come on. No, uh-uh. You can either finish your story or you can continue on my wife or we can go off. You know, whatever. Uh, this is uh, for your fun, too. So whatever, whatever direction you story. want to head. You, you'll like my story, I think. So go ahead. Tell, tell your, finish telling uh, Assuming you haven't heard it already someplace. But um, so we come out of our movie, my daughter and I. She's about 19. Oh, you can't, you could, there was nobody there. There's nobody there. Right. I remember that part. Weird. We go in the parking lot. She points up in the sky and says, what's that? As I'm about to get in my car. And I look up. And 500 to 1,000 feet above us, roughly, I'm going to say a little bit less than a quarter of a mile from us, but not, it was not that far off the parking lot area. Uh, up in the sky, uh, I see a massive orange, maybe 20 or 30 orange lights. Now, you don't see orange lights in the sky. You see blue, red, white, sometimes maybe something a little green, but you don't see orange. Okay. And uh, so I'm thinking, well, okay, maybe they're clouds, maybe it's reflecting something, they're, you know, bouncing like the the same idea of the nightclub opening lights. Um, but there's nothing. I, I looked everywhere. Um, there was nothing that was being, and, and nothing that you could see. It, there were really weren't any clouds that night, uh, which was another thing. It was a very dark night, but uh, no clouds. And so that was odd. And the more I stared at it, the more I began to realize um, it was in a boomerang shape. And it was the size of a football field. And it was just sitting there. And my daughter's looking at it and she's panicking, saying, let's go, let's go, let's go. And I said, no, I want to see what this is. I had no idea what this was. And uh, so we, I stared at it for the longest time. Never occurred to me to take a photograph of it which is part of the deal. That's what they do. Sure. Um, uh, and eventually off of the, uh, I guess you'd call it sort of the left wing on the left side. Um, and this was not triangular, by the way, it was boomerang. Uh, yeah. And there's a difference. Uh, and it was huge. And it was sitting there, not moving and no noise. And eventually there's a white, light that telescopes open like this off of that wing it's white it's luminescent it's not like any light i ever saw in the sky before because it had no rays coming off of it it was completely luminescent self-contained and it telescopes open to what i estimate to be about 15 or 20 feet it was a huge huge white orb it detaches off of the wing and starts uh, sort of wandering around the exterior of this massive craft like it's looking for something. I don't know what it was looking for. People have asked me if, if I felt like it was looking for us. I don't know that. I have no idea. At any rate, it then went, disappeared behind the craft momentarily, reappeared on top of it, came back over, went back to the original wing where it came from, and then collapsed, disappeared, poof, gone. And at that point, my daughter was terrified out of her mind. She said, we have to go, 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 go. So I said, all right. So we got in the car and uh, we drive, you know, two minutes back to our house. And um, I said, look, I said this in the car. I said, before we say a word to each other, I, I don't want to say anything. I'm going to give us some, some, some stuff to draw with when we get home. And we're both going to draw whatever it was that we saw which we did, and they were absolutely identical. And she then said, well, we have to do something. We have to, we have to call the police. And she picks up the phone, and she's, about, she's calling them. And I said, uh, put the phone down for one second, please. <laughs> I said, what exactly are you gonna tell them? Well, well, I'm gonna tell them, you know, what we saw. I said, hmm, I don't think that's a great idea. How about, how about, um, you asked them if anybody has seen anything unusual in the sky tonight. 
She said, okay. So she calls them, and of course they said no. Anyway, long story short, or not so short, for the next almost two years, it was at least a year and a half, she and I would have telephone call interruptions every time we spoke with each other. She was in Brooklyn, I was in New Jersey. Didn't matter, landlines, cell phones, any combination, didn't matter. Uh, suddenly, there would be a voice that would interrupt both of us. We could no longer speak to each other because we couldn't hear each other, but we could both hear it. And it came through like a massive sort of male sounding electronic voice through serious distortion waves. Not like your typical sort of voice distortion, you know, machinery stuff. This was weird. And it was speaking a language that I couldn't understand. And I understand at least the basics of an awful lot of languages. And I, I couldn't make heads or tails of it. And it would talk to us. At one point it said my daughter's name. And uh, then what it would do after, and it seemed to make sentences. They seemed to have, you know, modulation to them. And uh, then when it was sort of done saying whatever it was that it was trying to say to us, which maybe somehow got through on a different line, level, okay, that I don't know consciously, uh, it would hang up both of us simultaneously. And then we wouldn't be able to call each other back for five to 10 minutes. And it did that consistently for close to two years. And eventually it did it with some of, between her and some of her friends and me and some of my clients. And so that's what got me started on, well, what the heck are they saying? How do you talk to an alien? I do think it was an alien. I don't think it was human. Uh, yeah, your show, your um, story is good. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so er, every time you called your daughter or what, how, did, how often did it get on the phone with you guys? How did it go again? Tell us again, more time. Well, I mean, uh, every time that we would talk on the phone, it didn't matter. Every time I mean, you and your daughter would talk. Yep. And But and it also else. came on with other people, too. Only when one of us was on the phone with the other people, but not with anybody else in the family. Okay. Um, so I do think that that probably was connected to that event of whatever that sighting was. Right. Okay. Oh, and I forgot to say, the entire craft... Uh, disappeared in three phases that night. First, the wingtips, they were gone like that. Then the midsection of the wings gone, and then the center poof gone. It didn't travel. It was either, you know, cloaked or dematerialized or whatever, but it was gone. Yeah, my, my first one ended something like that. Different, very different, but similar. What was your first one? Uh, well, if... If I told you now, we'd be here all night. It's like, it was like an hour long encounter and at least an hour. And it takes at least uh, 20, 30 minutes, if not more, tell it. If you try to go through it real, if I try to go through it real fast in detail, it would take me at least 30 minutes, 20, 30 minutes minimum. I forget half of it because it, you know, you, you get so far through and you go, oh, I forgot this. And you go back and you, you know, there's a lot of detail. It was a very long encounter, October 3rd, 1980, uh, 11 p.m., northwest corner of Houston, Texas. Um, yeah, I don't want to get into it. it it's, just, it's very long. Anyway, uh, the, only, the only similarity between the two was that um, the way it ended was um, it, this thing turned off one light at a time it's a it was a circular craft it was like the ones people are talking about craft and um uh, and uh the, what's the country at war that russia just is at war ukraine yeah there's a sign some scientists in ukraine they're talking about um uh, craft that are appearing above ukraine yes and, i've heard that and um they say there's light craft and dark craft and i never heard anybody 
describe dark craft before because that's what I saw. My craft was dark and uh, it was like a black hole with 80 quid distant lights around the edge and nothing else. It was literally absorbing all light. There was no surface of any kind noticeable. Anyway, the only similarity uh, that might, would make me think about that one was the way it ended. It would, it, they decided it's time for them to go because I, I was going to go with them. They came to take me with them permanently as I'm gone. And uh, because I was considering committing suicide at the time. So they knew I was ready to leave the planet. So um, that's why they came. And, and I was ready to go. And the last minute I changed my mind. And, and so they left. And they, what happened was it's spinning slowly counterclockwise and uh, from left to right. And um, when the lights came around and it was dark. And what's really odd is that we're talking about a night sky, no surface, dark with a dark dot going across it. How do you see a dark dot on a dark surface in a dark night without a moon? I'm like, I could see the dark dot, but I don't know why I could see it because there was nothing behind it. You know, there was nothing around the dot or behind the dot that would illuminate the dot. So for it's really, really strange that I was seeing a black dot on a black surface, but I did. You, you know what that reminds me of? Um, it reminds me of shadow people in the paranormal world because they are blacker than black. Well, the craft was darker than the night sky. And the only thing that was lighting the night sky that night was there was no moon, but there was a lot of stars, a whole lot of stars. So the stars were lighting up the night. Other than that, there was no other light, and um, except for maybe the house lights. And um, so it made a full circle, and that same black dot was there this, uh, after the circle, and there was another dot, black dot behind it, and went a full circle around, and there was three black dots, and when it were circle, full circle around, four black dots, and it kept making a full circle every time it make a full circle it would turn off one of the lights until all eight lights were gone were off and once they were all off it was no longer sitting there it was uh it had cloaked or whatever it was doing it didn't shoot off and i could see three uh stars equal uh they were all also equidistant like like the lights on the craft uh they had eight lights on the circle equidistant and the stars that were then visible after it disappeared, were sitting right behind it. And I couldn't mm -hmm. see them mm -hmm. until it was gone. Once it was gone, I could see the three light stars directly behind it. And they were just, you know, equidistant from each other. And, and at that point, um, are you a Star Trek fan? You know, I never was. <laughs> yeah, but go ahead. But anyway, uh, there was an episode where um, I forgot the name of the episode, but there was these two guys that were fighting and one was they were black on one side and white on the other side. And, but they were opposite each other. It wasn't he one of them was black on the right side. The other one was black on the left side. And, you know, that they weren't identical. They were mirror opposites. So they were like, uh, you know, like. Blacks, Hispanics, and whites here. They were just, they were at each other's throat and trying to kill each other. And there was a point, there were, whenever they were fighting and they would touch each other, the un, there would be two universes that would be switching place from each other. And you'd see a whole star field disappear and another star field would come on at the same time and they would go back and forth between these two universes that were, there were, fighting they were representing their fight with each other and so from the moment my craft disappeared till the moment i set foot in my mother's driveway which was a long walk uh, kind of a long walk um the stars in the sky were 
um, it's really odd, hard to explain. If you took a quarter and put it out, uh, you know, arm's distance, and you took, say, 10 to 20 stars within the space of that quarter, it seems like way too many stars. And it really is. There was more stars out that night than any night of my life. And I've never seen anywhere near that many. And But all those stars within the size of a quarter would, would literally go off simultaneously. And another different set of stars within that shape of a quarter would come on to replace those stars. And they would go back and forth, changing places, all going off. And the others coming on at the same time, going back and forth, just like on that Star Trek episode. And this was happening independently in the sh in the space of a quarter across the sky, as far as I could see in every direction. All the uh, stars within that biggest space would all go off simultaneously within that space. And another different set would come on when those went off within that space. And this was happening independently all across the sky. It was not together as one thing. It was every little space was happening independent of every other space. And it was making me very dizzy. And I, I actually uh, closed my eyes and went down on my knees for a moment. And, and uh, you know, I was closed my eyes and, and I'm like, and I, I stood back up and I looked up and it's still doing it in every direction. And I walked back to my mother's house on Colony Court, and I um, and it and I kept looking around, and it kept doing it every as far as I could see in every direction. The whole time I was walking, all the way when I stood stepped in her driveway, or just before I stepped in her driveway, I I wasn't looking up at the sky, and I looked back up. I looked around, all the stars were back to normal. So that was the end of my okay. first encounter. So my second encounter was on NASA base before the first space shuttle launch. It was, um, I was going on uh, base with these strangers who took me into their um, family and uh, in a station wagon, one of those old station wagons with fake wood on the side, looked like wood oh, paneling, but it was fake. Those are called uh, LTDs. I used to have one. Yeah, well, um, we were. Do you remember the first space shuttle launch? They got down to ten seconds, and it they stopped the count, and then they held it for like one or two hours, and they scrubbed the launch. That was like on a Friday, either a Thursday or Friday, and then they rescheduled the launch for like the next Monday or Tuesday, like four or five days later. So. Um, what, what what year was that? Uh, 81. April 13th, 81, the day before my birthday was, I don't know if that was the day it actually launched or the day it was supposed to launch. Uh, but in any case, it was supposed to launch on a Friday and it lost, launched on a Monday or Tuesday. And anyway, uh, I brought a Virago 750 in order to take it down to the beach, to park it on the beach, to have somebody notice it, to have them come over and start talking about it. And then they would have a pass to get on base. And that's what happened. I took it, parked it on Cocoa Beach. And this guy walked over and started looking at it. And he, we started a long conversation. He said, How, where are you seeing the launch from? I said, I have no idea. He said, well, I've got a pass to get on base. And he had actually an executive pass. It was a, it was like three or four different levels of passes. And the one he had was the kind where you could actually get as close as possible to the shuttle. And we parked. In a, and this is this is a random guy. Random guy. Okay. Uh, well, random in the sense that he was random to me, but I went there to meet the guy and to have him take me on base. And that's what happened. It worked out exactly as I expected it to have. Anyway, uh, um, so we're, I'll fast forward a little bit past the, I have to skip a few things because I don't want to make this my story. But we're, um, 
we're on base. I guess it was the second time uh, when it actually launched. And it's like five in the morning or 530. It's pre-dawn. There's no, no moon, no stars. And uh, I have a, I get the feeling I should tell these people about my first close encounter. The one that I haven't told you about, but you can listen to it on one of my shows. And uh, so I tell them, I, I take the time. We're going through this. We're going on base. The car in front of us is like two car lengths ahead of us. The guy behind us is two car lengths behind us. We're going five miles an hour or up to 15. I don't know how fast we're going, but somewhere between five and 15 miles an hour. Very slow. And, uh, and so I tell them the whole encounter, it takes like 30 minutes to tell it easy. And uh, so the second I get through telling the story, I say the last word out of my mouth and the German teenager, I think he was German. He was like 20 to 23 ish uh, in the passenger seat. He laughs at me. He doesn't believe my story. He thinks I'm lying or whatever. And he laughs. And so in my head, I, I, I speak to God. I said, I, I wish you would show them what I saw. And within uh, one to three seconds, I got my wish. And the craft was instantly in front of us. And it looked exactly like the first one. Uh, a black hole with eight equidistant lights around the edge. The only difference was it wasn't vibrating. The first one was vibrating. The second one was one over Cape Canaveral was not vibrating. So um, it's turning from left to right. And I looked around. There was two children sitting to my left and another one sitting behind me in the station wagon. The youngest one, he was like five or six. He was in the uh, where the luggage would be on the hard surface, and there was a older, older. I don't remember if the boy was older or the girl. Anyway, there's uh, the older boy and girl were sitting to my left. I was in the right passenger seat on the second bench, and um, we drove under this thing. It was like right in the middle of the road the causeway road as we were curving left it was way out in front of us about the same distance as the first one i saw except it was lower a little bit lower it was actually a lot lower and uh we drove straight under this thing but the it, when that guy laughed at me or the young man laughed at me and i wished god would show them too and i got the wish and the craft was there the kid said to the uh the father of the other children, the, the driver, he said, maybe that's what he saw. And the driver said, yeah, maybe that is what he saw. And after that conversation uh, between the young man and the father, uh, it's like instantly the adults in the car besides me um, lost all interest in the craft. It's like it, it's like it no longer existed. They wow. didn't care. They didn't look up at it. They didn't stare at it. Nothing. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And the children to my left, the two to my left, one behind me, were as if Batman, uh, Mr. Freeze and Batman shot them with a the freeze ray. They did not move even their eyeballs. They were dead frozen the whole time. It was from the second it appeared to the second it was gone. They were dead frozen. They did not move a muscle. All three of them. So how many people were in the car with you? Uh, well, there's three children and two adults plus me. So that's. Uh, and you were three. the only person you were the only person who wasn't in like suspended animation. Correct. Well, no, 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 that's not correct. The kids were in suspended animation. The adults were fully animated. They just didn't care. They didn't. Ca right. Right. They didn't care. So when I was in Peru um, and I me and. Uh, two other adults were standing behind this uh, thatched, huge thatched hut that we all lit, that a bunch of us lived in. Uh, this kid 
looks up and sees this craft and it's really hard to see it's tiny and um and i looked up and saw it also and realized it was something and he went in and got the binoculars and that's another long story anyway the only reason i bring that up is because there was a lady who was the she was like the mentor to the kid that went in and got the binoculars and she was like this like what you do psych psychologist or whatever her his parents put her in charge of him taking him to peru and doing the ayahuasca very strange but parents <laughs> anyway <laughs> uh, i can't imagine fixing your kid by sending him to do ayahuasca that just doesn't make sense at all anyway oh, that's, uh, a, that's a whole other conversation yeah well she was sitting uh, this lady who was the psychologist or mentor or whatever in charge of this little boy fixing him up, uh, she was leaning against this thatched hut. And the three of us, three adult males, who were all three looking at this thing, and uh, two of us could see it through binoculars, but the young boy, he couldn't, he had glasses, so he couldn't use the binoculars. So, um, we all said to the lady sitting against the hut, there's a craft up here, come look. She would not get off the thatch, she wouldn't get off her rear, leaning against the hut and get up and look at it. She didn't care. It was yeah. the same as the uh, two adults <laughs> in the car. Yep. Yeah. So anyway, back to you. No, I think that's, uh, and where that was in Iquitos? I was in Iquitos. Because I went to, I, I, the thing I want to tell you is that, it, Long time ago, I went. Uh, I went to Iquitos and went down the Amazon, deep into the jungles, and ended up you know, staying in a jungle camp and meeting uh, some of the tribes people down there. And that was long enough ago that nobody was doing that. But I didn't have an encounter down there. Well, my uh, the place. Th I did ayahuasca two different two different places, and one uh, they were both about um, like six miles outside of Iquitos. They weren't in Iquitos, mm -hmm. but they were near Iquitos. Mm -hmm. And the the day after um, we saw the thing up in the sky, and it was sitting up there, stationary with the stars, and stayed stationary with the stars, and drifted across the sky with the stars for like two hours while I watched it, okay? And everybody else left and went inside and went to bed. And I'm the only person out there looking at this thing. I got binoculars and and uh, and it's this really strange craft. I won't go into it because this really isn't my story, but I'm bringing this last part up because, um, well, for some reason I was bringing it up. I can't remember what it is, but, uh, oh, yeah. The day after uh, that encounter was the next day was my was the day before I left, right? So I'm sitting uh, bus behind the same thatched hut with one of the owners of this complex, and uh, his wife. He's sitting to my left. His wife is sitting to my right, and um, and his son is sitting straight across from me. He's I'm speaking English to him. He's speaking English to me. Then he's translating what I'm saying to his wife, who only speaks Spanish. And his son is probably listening and probably only speaks Spanish also. They're both native uh, Peruvian. And, uh, and she tells him that the assistant to the, one of the cooks on the night before saw a circular craft over the complex, totally separate from everything I've told you. So you had different people getting encounters in the same complex on the same night with different mm -hmm. craft, totally different craft, unrelated, as far as we know, unrelated to each other in one night. And so what do you think? Uh, and <laughs> what do you mean? What I think? Uh, I don't really have 
any thoughts about it other than it was uh, one of the many, 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 many strange things that I've gone through in my life. It was just another, um, that was the beginning of a really long story. You've never done the ayahuasca, have you? No, I won't. Well, it's good that you don't do it because it's not good. People say it's good, but okay. I talked to one person who said, I told them about my experience and they said, did you do the week of cleansing before you did it? And I said, no, we didn't do a week of cleansing. And they said, well, if you had done a week of cleansing before you did it, your experience would have been totally different. It wouldn't have been as it was. And so, but with me, it opened me up psychically, like opening a can of, uh, a can with a can opener. I was a, like a super psychic for like two years after that. And um, you really don't want to be that psychic. That's too psychic. You're seeing things that most psychics will never dream of seeing. You're, you're like uh, really, really, really psychic. And you can see all the dark things that are happening in this world that people don't see. Even psychics don't see them because they're just, it's not meant for you to see those things. They're, they're pretty scary. I mean, I tuned myself one time to see my own attaching spirit. I have two attaching spirits, one on my head and one on my back. And I tuned myself to see one of them one day. And uh, it's kind of scared me, so I tuned myself off real quick. Uh, but uh, you, uh, I only, I've only seen one attaching spirit to somebody. It was like a gin looking thing. That's that one scared the you know what out of me, and uh, but I've seen a lot of a whole bunch of during that two year period. Uh, there was a couple of days there where I was under psychic attack and and I saw um, um, people's etheric body, causal body, mental body, something body, one of their other bodies. It's not their physical body. It looked to me like their physical body, but I knew it wasn't. And what was happening is I would see their eyes. There was like three, three or four different occasions within a two. Actually, it was not within a two or three day period. It was like within a six month period. And uh, where I would see their eyes moving around really fast in their heads, like real fast. And I knew that was a symptom of them having attaching spirits. And one was a little girl, and one was like one of three, one out of every three people in the uh, in a uh, in a uh, hallway of a a courthouse while I was waiting to go in to see the judge. Like one out of three people had uh, their eyes were moving around real fast like that. I knew those people were the people that were going to see the judge who had committed a crime or were accused of committing a crime. And the people who didn't have their eyes doing that were their friends who were no, not, not criminals, not accused criminals, not there to see the judge. They were just people supporting the accused people like me. And, um, and there was a time when I was on the street where every single person on the street, every single person, their eyes were doing that. Now, that, you don't want to be in a position like that because that's basically like hell on earth. You're, everybody's got uh, demons or something attached to them. When every single person has that, you don't want to, you don't want to see that. It's not, it's, not, uh, it's not something, it's not a position you ever want to put yourself in. So, and it would, it was worse than that. I mean, we had the, uh, the problem with being that psychic is that when you can see the darkness, the darkness can also see you. And, um, and it wants to come at you. And you still have barriers around you, but it's trying to come at you. And uh, you're not going to experience that just being psychic. That's you're, when you do. Um, even LSD won't have that effect on you, but DMT will. And um, 
it 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 draw it i got my attaching spirits because of smoking pot i stayed high morning noon, and night for 16 18 18 years and uh that's how i got my two attaching spirits and so it, they make um smoking pot or cigarettes or alcohol or a whole bunch of other different things if you do those things very frequently they will make swiss cheese out of your aura but those are the barriers directly directly around you besides that you also have psychic protection that is outside the walls of the room you're in it's you're stretched out pretty far and those barriers start dropping when you do the psych the the more potent psychedelics like dmt it starts making holes in those barriers and that's when you not only can see the darkness but the darkness can see you and it will like um what happened to me was like um for instance my wife and i would be in bed trying to sleep we'd be half asleep and our dogs would be sitting between us uh, one of those we still have and one has passed and you'd have like a hand grenade go off in the living room and it would be that loud like literally like a hand grenade the only difference is you no know, shockwave and uh you'd be like what caused such a loud uh, bang in the living room so I, you know the dogs would jump up start barking their heads off so this is not something that's happening in my head and i would go in the living room look around there's nothing in the living room and so um when i say your psychic barriers are uh, minimized uh, I'm, in this case i'm talking about the ones that are further out away from your body and even even when those come down you still have other protection but but it, the darkness can't see you very clearly just like you can see it so it becomes you come under psychic attack very easily and that can be uh, a big problem and you know i've i don't even think i've ever told yeah i have told that story if you listen to one of my 30 interviews you'll you'll hear that story too so that's another story anyway back to you so well just to comment on, on what you said i mean all that's very um powerful sort of profound stuff and most people don't go that deep to discover what that is that you're talking about. Um, I I won't do that. Uh, I guess for me because I I know from uh, I I tried I I did uh, hallucinogenic when I was quite young, and uh, it it uh, really scared the hell out of me. And it scared the hell out of me because I understood essentially what you're talking about having to do with barriers. And I also know myself well enough now to know that um, I'm far too sensitive that uh, I already have probably much more thinned out barriers than, than most people do. Um, I see stuff and sense things and know things that people don't so do i need to completely like you know bomb the the <laughs> the, the boundary walls i don't think so i mean the whole idea if i mean i i uh, seem to be added to these groups of of top these are top level scientists um who are working on consciousness issues and uh, I mean, the, I think everybody kind of agrees that, I mean, the, the, the brain, the reason why we got this brain is, you know, more than it's being sort of the expanding factor, it's the, it, it's the barrier factor. It's what prevents us from, you know, going into that completely explosive mode of those kinds of experiences. Um, and one last thing, I mean, I, I think I disagree with you as to, I mean, you feel that, you know, if you see 
the negativity or the darkness as you're calling it or whatever or if you want to view it more as sort of demonic stuff wh whatever however you're whatever language you're using on it um i don't think seeing it makes you more visible to the contrary i think that if you're walking around um exuding light in a, in the positive sense all positive sense okay of the word uh that you are absolutely a target and you're quite visible in that sense. Yeah, well, OK, so. I guess I should. Uh, let me put myself back on the screen here. Um, I, I should quantify it. I'm sure it can see you just fine regardless, but it. Um, you're not going to notice it trying to attack you if you're just because you're at a level of psychic ability that is like any other psychic okay. out there. I, I understand. I get they're it. Not going to be attacking you constantly. You know, they're not you're not going to hear them banging on what I would hear. What I would happen was I would hear them banging like my wife and I heard uh, rapping. So I know what psychic knocking on the walls is i've heard it go up the wall and across the ceiling before we're familiar with that that's not what i'm talking about the banging i'm talking about is much louder and it's on a barrier that's outside the walls and mm -hmm. they're not physical barriers mm -hmm. and so um you're not going to hear that sort of thing as a normal psychic i would think unless you're uh maybe uh amy allen is her name the lady from the Dead Files, I finally remembered her name, Amy Allen. Uh, maybe she uh, experiences this. I mean, they they follow her home and I'm not sure how she keeps herself clean, but uh, she's, uh, I'm surprised you've never watched any of her shows. She's, um, she gets in the darkness quite a bit on her shows, which you don't hear very much in a lot of these psychic shows. They don't get into the real dark stuff. She does. And I really don't understand why um, most people, most psychics don't get into that stuff very often. That did, I must uh, assume that it, on as many paranormal investigations as you've been on that you've seen or experienced that stuff quite a bit, yes? Well, let me put it this way. I made sure that every team that I was invited in to uh, was not uh, working with uh, demonic spirits. I won't I won't do anything having to do with anything demonic. Um, I do believe like attracts like. OK, and I do believe that if you are, um, you know, enticing, um, activating, um, encouraging, whatever it is, you know, because you're focused on that, that you will get it. And I know plenty of people who, I have plenty of uh, friends who are uh, different types of, of secular and religious exorcists. And I, I have know plenty of people who will go in as mediums. They love that stuff because somehow it's exciting for them. I don't find it exciting. I have plenty of friends who've walked home, you know, from things with all different types of attachments. Some people have been able to get rid of them. Some of them have not. I know people who've gotten, uh, you know, their pets died. Some of them died. Uh, they came, they had serious illnesses. I have absolutely no reason to want to explore that, and I won't, and I don't. I What I do that a lot of um, psychics won't do is, as I said, I mean, I, I started this whole sort of journey um, doing my, my 10 year apprenticeship uh, to um, a psychic detective. So I will look at stuff that a lot of psychics, they don't want to because it's it's horrible, it's it's scary, it's frightening, it's it's violent, all that kind of stuff. But when I'm looking at those things, I'm looking at it from a point of view of I'm doing a service in, in the form of, it's, it's a type of a healing for uh, people who need to know, or sometimes for the spirits on the other side that need a healing also in that sense because they got to be heard and i could tell you all kinds of stories along those lines but so that i'll do 
but I will not in absolutely no circumstances while I seek out negativity or evil or demonic stuff. I knew that right from the get go because I could feel it. I could feel that if I opened up this much, it was going to creep in wherever it could. And that's got, I mean, I I think it's hilarious that these guys on these, um, you know, these ghost hunter shows, they big guys that go in with their like paramilitary gear and their, their boots and they're, they're, you know, almost carrying like guns or weapons, but instead they're carrying their EMF meters and their whatever. And they're going in and, and they're taunting and, you know, cursing and I dare you are nothing. You're a, th-, you know, and they're, they're trying to provoke. And I say, these idiots, they have no idea what they're provoking. And the second that any of them, that they hear this little, as you're like a little knock or something, they flip out and they go running. They're absolutely terrified. It's absurd. People don't have respect for the negativity. That's what I believe. They don't understand that it is a power. And it's it's a very dangerous power. And unless you know, uh, you know, I tell people, don't even go to the psychic realm at all. Um, I tell everybody, know your allies, know your spiritual allies, because you're quasi-physical. And if you're wandering around without the full uh, spiritual um, understandings and knowledge and experience and all that, you're like a babe in the woods. I mean, you're just wide open. You're just fair game. Okay, uh, so where would you like to go from here? <laughs> now that we've uh, hit a low point, what would you like to talk about next? I'll let you choose something this time, maybe. I don't think it's a low point. I think it's a teaching point. Okay, well, I say low. I mean, low as in um, negative. Negative, uh, well, yeah, I mean, but but that's a um, a lot of times people don't talk about it when I, I think that it's, you know, you can talk about the fun stuff, but talk about the, the other stuff, too. It's important to understand. You can't go in um, fearful. You have to go in, you know, uh, feeling fully confident and, and brave. And it's really important, I think. So, yeah. So you said you had uh, you knew people that got attachments that were able to get rid of them. How did they get rid of them? I'm trying to think. Um, I think most of the time it was through having uh, almost like like um, banishment, you know, where they. It, it was a real kind of a tough conversation to the spirits. Um, and they, uh, you have to, I think you've got to confront force with force in a sense. Um, I don't think any of them did it in a really mild way at all. They, they, That's funny. I I have, I mean, people who I I can think of. Uh, one of my one of my friends who um, had done a bunch of um, she she did more secular exorcism, but anyway, and she came back from one with um, she didn't realize she'd come back with anything, and she was looking for a uh, a book I think in her bookshelf or she was next to her bookshelf, and the uh, Bible flew off the shelf and I think smacked her in the head or something. And it was sort of a clear message, or she understood it that way, that she, and then it went after her kids. And that's when it gets really kind of scary. Um, I made sure I didn't do any, any of this kind of work uh, at all when my kids were growing up. Uh, because for the same reason that they can attack people who are weak, who are vulnerable, who are mentally ill, who are doing drugs, who are drinking, whatever it is, that's when you create, you know, the the softness, the vulnerability, the holes in the aura, whatever you want to call it, sure. that's going to uh, allow uh, 
access. And um, anytime you diminish your consciousness. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, I had a, a friend of mine. I was sitting, uh, I was sitting in a bar in New York with a couple of, well, it was three really good friends, and two of them knew each other. My friend who was next to me didn't know them. And we're having a conversation, and she, I know uh, they weren't totally getting along because they were totally different types of people. And anyway, at one point, she, and you know, I'm I'm having my whatever it was, uh, cosmopolitan, whatever it was. And at one point, she reached over and put her hand and went, and I said, you know, what are you doing? I, it was kind of odd. And she said. Uh, there's been a, I don't know what she called it, an entity that was standing behind me for quite a while and waiting for that opportunity because I was drinking. I was on my second drink. And uh, I think she saw it uh, in the sort of act of attempting to sort of jump in and had, uh, you know, sort of yanked it out of my area. Um yeah, so I don't um, I don't know that I have a clear answer for you on how people get rid of attachments. Everybody I know, I think, has done it a different way, some with more success than others. I mean, I had another friend who spent the longest time. Uh, she she came back with attachments from uh, she used to get to Gettysburg all the time to do paranormal investigations. I used to do a bunch down there also. <clears throat> and um, she had come back, I think, with a she said it was a Confederate soldier. And she could describe him and stuff. And and he wasn't terrible. He was just bothering her and hanging around. She had this, uh, it was like an armoire or something. And she couldn't get rid of him. She tried everything. And finally, I think I had this long conversation with her about doing a, a thing. You probably know about this. You did some paranormal investigations. But you you sprinkle a bunch of like uh, flour or baby powder on the floor. See if you can get the footsteps my wife uh, likes to do that with uh, just inside the door because she believes that people are always coming into our apartment while we're not there. So oh, she does that for real humans, not for ghosts. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, hey, you know, whatever works yeah. for, you know, physical, non-physical, whatever. But I think she finally did get some footsteps and she managed, but it took her years to get rid of whoever this was, who sort of took a fancy to her. I'd actually, <laughs> I had gone to a, um, uh, she and I had gone to a very well-known uh, haunted bed and breakfast. It was in Gettysburg. And um, I had gotten, cause I had set up the reservations. I told the uh, innkeeper, I said, yeah, I want that, you know, in the oldest part of the, uh, this used to be um, uh, a field hospital. And so, of course, you know, in the in those days, or at least during the Civil War, the the doctors in there were doing all the amputations, and then they pile up even to the second story windows of all the old the the limbs and things. It was there's you can still see the blood stains on the floor, I and mean, kind of a gory thing. But anyway, I got the room that was alleged to be haunted by some guy, <laughs> and uh, I remember uh, uh, we had gone in there and. I had recalled that the, this particular um, spirit, whose name was apparently John, um, really liked blondes, which she was platinum blonde, and um, really seemed to prefer whoever was sleeping in the twin bed that was next to the window. So I said to my friend, well, here, here's a great bed for you, went next to the window, and, <laughs> and you should take it. And uh, so <laughs> she was absolutely fearless. So she said, yes. Anyway, the, the spirit did apparently uh, get right into bed with her, uh, put his arms around her, put his hands all over uh, her backside to the point where she literally jumped and screamed. And uh, I had wrapped myself in like spiritual barbed wire. I said, <laughs> That's it, you know. <laughs> Nobody's got anywhere near me. That's it. Um, but she's she always tells that <laughs> that story because she said, "Ah, oh, yeah, 
Yeah, Nancy really, you know, left left me out for for that one. But anyway, but but I got payback because years later, I had completely forgotten about that. Go back there with my husband, completely forgotten that this spirit in there. And by the way, I got all kinds of orb photos and stuff like that in the room. Um, forgotten the spirit liked, you know, blondes in the bed next to the window. So I get into that bed and I'm relatively blonde-ish. And uh, around four o'clock in the morning, and I'm finally falling asleep, I get awoken by the un most unbelievable, it was like a cross between a screech and a howl that almost shook the room. And it seemed to be from right outside the window. And of course I jump out of my bed, I look out the window and I don't see anything. It seems to, I can hear something wrestling in tall grass, but it's dark out. And I've no, so of course then I, my eyes are wide open. I can't fall asleep the rest of the night. The next day I get up and I'm sitting at breakfast. I asked the innkeeper, I said, look, do you have any like wild dogs or or weird cats or or strange birds that make these incredible, horrible, horrific noises? And she said, no. And uh, one of the people who was at the bed and breakfast said to me, she was at the next table over, she said, you know, did you ever consider maybe it was the um, the rebel yell that was done, you know, by the Confederate soldiers during the Civil War? And I said, what's that? Being a good Yankee that I am. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> which is ironic because I've done a past life regression and I was able to determine I was a, and you'd appreciate this, a Texan Confederate officer. And I could care less about, you know, a lot of military stuff. I mean, it just never interested me. The, American history was the only class I ever fell asleep in in high school. At any rate, off track, back to my story. So she says, do you ever consider Rebel Yell? I said, no. A few months later, I'm researching online. I said, well, you know, let me see if I can look up what a Rebel Yell might sound like. So I Wikipedia it. And of course, it's all written out because you can't find out what's a rebel yell. And it said something like a, you know, a yippee, ya, 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 you boo hoo. I said, well, what the heck is that? Didn't, you know. And then I discover a 1930s recording of a 90 year old man who was a young teenager during the war. He was a, in the Confederate Army. And the recording says, can you do a rebel yell? And he does it. And I said, that's it. That's exactly what it was. It sounds like a, a, a barking, yowling, screeching, really loud sound. And by the way, there, when I checked this, the property outside the window, there's no tall grass. There probably was during the Confederate, you know, during the war. Anyway. That you got me off on a whole long story. I got myself off on a whole long other story there. Um, okay, so let's go back to uh, your book, How to Talk to an Alien. Mm -hmm. um, you had the one encounter with your, what was it, your daughter? Or who was it? Who was you? you were with your daughter, right? Yeah. Okay. I had another encounter with her also. Go ahead. We want to hear everything. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. This one, she, this was uh, earlier. I told you that I knew a bunch of uh, uh, demonologists. Right, secular and religious. So, where do I start this? I'm driving her to Pittsburgh so she can look at colleges. So I'm driving her and her little brother. My wife and, is from that area. Go ahead. Oh, okay. Yeah. 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 So I was out there for a while. So, but I've been everywhere pretty much. Uh, at any rate, um, so the two of them are in the backseat of the car, they're both sleeping. I'm driving somewhere around the, you know, the the uh, foothills of the, Alle the Allegheny Mountains. And it's beautiful country out there. 
uh, it was sort of getting to dusk and twilight and all that, and I'm incredibly bored. And I say, if there are any UFOs out there, why don't you, you know, show yourselves right now? Because I figured it's a good time, and why not? And I'm bored. And, of course, nothing shows itself. And we get to our hotel in downtown Pittsburgh, and uh, they watch. I put them in one bed. I was in the other bed. I was exhausted. They watched a pay-per-view, which was the, uh, uh, you know, the the movie about Benjamin Buttons, where the guy gets, instead of growing old, yeah, he ages backwards, right? Yeah. And so they watch that. I go to sleep. And in the middle of the night, my I hear my daughter, and she, she was a sleep talker. And so I was used to, nah, that, nah, that, that, what, yeah, that, that, you know, stuff like that. That wasn't it. She sudden, and I was annoyed, I was going to go shake her, but I didn't. Suddenly, she sits bolt upright in her bed, sits up, her eyes flip open. She's looking straight ahead, and she says, I mean, forget about the grace. I don't know what you humans mean by grace anyway. And then eyes close, falls back, and she's dead asleep. (laughs) So I... At that point, my heart's pounding. I jump out of bed. I write down exactly what she said because I didn't want to forget it. I knew it was intended for my ears because the day before I had been, uh, I had interviewed the top exorcist at the Vatican and he had talked about psychics and uh, um, only working with certain types of psychics, which I thought was interesting. Um, They had to be what he called charismatics. I didn't know what a charismatic was. So I was researching, and apparently they work with charisms. Well, okay, so what's a charism? I spent the longest time. I couldn't figure out. It was so... I I got in touch with one of my exorcist friends who sent me a whole bunch of Vatican literature, which explains sort of what charisms were, but it was very complicated. Eventually I realized, oh, there are things... uh, A charism is a thing like uh, laying on of hands, prophesizing... um, um, sort of faith healing and 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 stuff like that, which, by the way, is all stuff that I do. I just don't call it that under the the umbrella of the Catholic religion. Sure. Um, and I realized, oh, it's called a grace. So the next night, when my daughter is suddenly waking up in the middle of the night, she says. I don't know what you humans mean by grace, or forget about the grace. I don't know what you humans mean by grace anyway. Poof, she's asleep. So I said, then I'm worried. So I'm thinking, uh, I hope I didn't rile up anything that is trying to reach me, mm, that I don't want to be reaching me. I'm not sure what that was, and they're using my kids. Uh so the next morning they wake up and I don't want to front load my daughter at all. And I say, well, you know, um, oh, I said, what does the word grace mean to you? She said, well, what do you mean? And I said, well, what does it mean? What do you understand it to mean? Oh, you mean like uh, like a ballerina? Yeah. Anything else? Eh, like Thanksgiving, what you say on Thanksgiving? Yeah. Anything else? Nah, that's all I could think of. Okay. And then I had this sort of brainstorm and I said, "Um, did you by any chance have any strange dreams last night? She said, no. (gasps) Oh, yeah, I did. I said, oh, really? What happened? Oh, well, I was, um, these aliens came and they took me away in their spaceship and they took me way, way, way out in the universe and some other universe and brought me to a different place or a different planet or whatever. And uh, then they said, you have to come back now. And then, and I didn't want to come back. And they said, you have to. So they brought me back. I said, really? Can you describe what that spaceship looked like? And she described it. I I had that dream also, except I watched that spacecraft leave that night. 
So years later, a friend Stop. of mine. You're okay. Um, hold on. So. Uh, obviously it wasn't a dream. You saw her leave with them. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. What did the craft look like? Well, I mean, it was a, a very basic, you know, uh, disc, uh, and I think it had a, you know, it had a bubble on it, but it was a basic silver disc type. So this was in the night or in the day? This was in the night. Yeah, it was in the night. And it ha how could you see, how did you see the silver of the craft? What light was there? Where was the light coming from? In the night? Oh. I don't know. I never th thought about that. I've only thought about the angle that I saw it departing. Um, oh, so there was enough light coming from like the buildings and stuff. Where you could see it. Or the streets. Yeah, but I don't recall seeing buildings. Okay, so where where were were y'all in a hotel or where were you? Yeah, we were in a hotel. Okay. And remember recall the moment you saw it leaving. Where were you standing and how far was it? Um the building say. must have been behind you. It was already up in the air and I'm and it was moving very, very fast and it was on an angle. And I'm gonna say it had to have been probably somewhere between five and ten city blocks. Away from you? Yeah. Oh, it had already it was already it moved. had already done whatever it was doing and it was on its way. Do you think it was taking her or dropping her off back? Oh, it was definitely taking her. Okay. And it was silver, a silver disc, unlit silver disc. Unlit, correct. But you could still see it was silver. Yep. So there must have been enough moonlight or starlight or building light or something light to show you the color of the craft. I guess so, yeah. Otherwise, yeah. you wouldn't have seen it at all. Yeah. And uh, go ahead. You you were continuing with the story, and I cut you well, off. Just, no, uh, just one final thought on that. And a friend of mine said to me years later, well, she said, because I told her what my daughter had said, you know, being, uh, which was, uh, uh, forget about the grace. I don't know what you humans mean by grace. Anyway, I got very concerned because my daughter's never, ever spoken like that. Why would you say something, you humans, for God's sake? That's clearly a, you know, she was a vehicle. Um, uh, and I was concerned about this, forget about the grace, which would suggest forget about God, forget about charisms. Okay, so that worried me a lot. And then also the concept, well, I don't know what you humans mean by grace anyway, which sort of had a bit of a demonic feel to it. You know, oh, why, okay, so, yeah, so there I, was got, that. I, got, I got all that from you. And but, but there was one more piece, which was yeah. my friend said, well, did you ever consider they were saying grays? Like gray aliens? Yeah, Forget that's what I thought you said originally. Yeah. But I didn't hear it that way when I heard it, nor did I write it down that way, because I'd been dealing the entire previous day with this exorcism stuff and the word grace. Okay, so you think she actually said grays, G-R-A-Y or G-R-E-Y-S or G-R-A-C-E? What do you think she actually said? I have no idea. That is one of the things that finally made me, when I ended up writing How to Talk to an Alien, um, I do write about angels and, and demons and the it's kind of there's there's a real crossover. Well, um, yeah. OK, so when I. At the very beginning of my first encounter. Um, I'm sitting in my 
Pontiac Le Mans, and this um, craft, which was just a black hole with eight equidistant lights around the edge. It was basically just a black hole with a ring of lights on the edge, and that's it, nothing more. It appeared the very first moment when it was present. I didn't, it appeared in the middle of my head, visually. And it was up above the, the um, car I was in, but across the street, like directly over the houses across the street. So it was above me, uh, out to my side, and present in that moment. But I'm sitting in the car, and I can't see it, but I'm seeing it in the middle of my head. And I've never been able to visualize I mean, I've visualized color inside my head once in my whole life. But other than that, I've never, I've tried to visualize my whole life. And aside from one successful attempt to visualize, I've never been able to visualize, ever. There's um, there's a name for that. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm familiar with it. I mean, I understand there's people that are By just... By the way. Go ahead. I have taught my style of remote viewing that I call TSP, right. I've taught it to two people who have that condition, that neurological condition, that they can't visualize. And both of them said, oh, no, I don't think I should take your course because I can't visualize anything. And I was able to teach both of them successfully. How to visualize. Yeah. Well, uh, I'm not saying I, I can't in the sense that I'm. it's impossible. I'm just saying I have had no success with it other than that one time. So what I saw in my head when the craft was up there, the craft itself was not a visualization created by me. That's all I'm saying, uh, mainly. And, but it, when it appeared in my head, it appeared just for a second, just long enough to me, me to see movement from left to right. And then it disappeared. And it did this like three or four times. And to me, I didn't like, oh, that's an alien craft. I was like, oh, what is that? And I did, it was just a ring of lights, just like it was in the real world, but it didn't represent an alien craft to me at the time. I didn't snap in my head going, oh, why did I see that UFO in my head? I just saw a ring of lights and did not snap to what it was in any way, shape or form. I didn't, I didn't come to the understanding it was an alien craft until I got out of the car and looked up and saw it in the sky. Okay, so, but between those two moments of seeing it flash on and off in my head three or four times and getting out of my car it was like probably close to an hour because I was in a state below, if you can imagine the lowest possible state of depression, I was below that. I was so low that I was like paralyzed, like I couldn't move but nothing was paralyzing me. I just didn't have the energy to move. I had no energy. Uh, I had no desire to do anything but die. Okay. And so uh, I was thinking about suicide and I wasn't thinking about aliens. And after I said, what's that? A few times in my head. And then it stopped appearing in my head. I went back to thinking about committing suicide. I wasn't thinking about aliens. But in my head, a conversation started between me and them. And um, I think I started the conversation. Actually, I said something like, I really would like to leave this planet. And, uh, and the answer was, uh, where would you go to leave the planet? I said, I would go anywhere to leave the planet. And then the next question was, would you go to hell to leave the planet? And I said, I would go anywhere to leave the planet. It was a really stupid conversation. And uh, if you took that conversation out of context and just said that, and you were a, a Christian and you were very religious, and you just listened to that conversation, and you said, that's it. That's the proof. They're demons, right? Then that's your proof. But if you fast forward to when I was on base, 
that I told you about before where the children were frozen and the second it appears, they're not seeing it. They're not moving uh, a muscle or even an eyelid. Um, what was in the craft, which looked the same as the first one, it's turned these children off for a reason. And the reason in my mind, logic, the only logical reason was they were too young to see it without it affecting them negatively. So not only would the beings in that craft not abduct people, but it didn't want to give the kids any negative experience at that age. So would a demon uh, have a worry about children like that? Obviously not. So that kind of swings it back in the other direction. So I always like to make that point, is that if you take pieces of the first encounter out of context, you might say, oh, demons. But if you put that in context with what happened in the second encounter, then you're not, you can't really pin it down so easily like that. Listen, I, I'm to I totally agree that it's all extremely muddled up. And by the way, my wonderful uh, CRV teacher, Lynn Buchanan, who I guess you have spoken with or you're going to be interviewing him. But well, if if we can ever sync our uh, senior moments together where we're not uh, missing each other. In other words, when the time is right, it will happen. Yes, go ahead. He uh, was always he, he's had some interesting uh experiences and encounters. Um, in fact, every time I went out to see him, uh, I always saw these uh, very interesting, um, well, let's just call them UFOs, but then again, it was right near a very interesting, um, you know, base there also. So who knows what's what, but, but the point is he always, uh, he was extremely sort of black and white in terms of you got the good guy aliens, you got the bad guy aliens, you got the good psychic ones, the bad psychic ones, the good non psychics, the bad non psychics. Right, okay. I'm familiar with his uh, beliefs. So he, yes. He, yes. he breaks it down in this very neat little grid. But frankly, uh, every time that I hear people talking about, and it doesn't matter if you're talking about, you know, angels or, or demons or, or aliens, different species of aliens, whatever, um, people, it's like the first question out of their mouth, well, are they good or are they bad? Are they evil or are they, you know, they're good? And all of that is the, these judgments that are highly dependent on, well, what are they going to do to us that we're going to recognize as being good to us or bad to us versus, you know, any higher level agendas of anything. I don't know that you can categorize something as necessarily evil. I mean, you could say the same thing about God. You know, people do that all the time. God, how could you, you know, let my my child die? God, how could you create sickness and illness and horrific wars on earth? How could you do that? You know, what kind of a God are you anyway? You can't be good. Well, the answer is maybe that's just a minuscule piece of some much larger, let's call it good, agenda for something maybe not necessarily for us in particular well um the way i look at aliens um in general i try not to parse them out i like look at them like um they're more like us than not like us in hu in humans you've got jeffrey Dahmer on one one end or hitler and you've got on the, you know, who cooked people. And on the other end, you've got somebody like Mother Teresa or, you know, people who basically would give you the shirt off their back if you needed it any day um, and would step in front of a bullet to save your life any day. You know, you've got in one race, you've got a whole spectrum. Now, an alien's. It's got to be the same way in, in any given single race. You've got um, ones that are better than others in that one race because they're all individuals as individuals, just like we're individuals. And I, I would think that most alien races, the vast majority of them, are self-serving. 
not necessarily self-serving as in it's all for me, but self-serving as in they want to survive just like the rest of us. They don't want to die. And so if they need your genetics to survive, they're going to take them. And um, and if they can help you at the same time, they probably will. Um, and so it's, I, w I went to a, um, a MUFON uh, meetup one time here in, uh, in the La greater Atlanta area. And it was probably the best MUFON event I've ever been to. Do you know why it was so good? Nope. Nobody showed up. Not a single person except me. And But there was one other person that showed up besides me. She was an abductee and or experiencer abductee. I guess abductee, yeah. And, uh, and together we realized nobody else showed up. So it was, it was her, her husband, and her, and, her, and her boy. The husband and boy had no interest in aliens. So they went into the, it was at a library. So they went into the library and was looking around at books. So I sat down with her and I got to ask this abductee every question I ever wanted to ask somebody who was an abductee. And she asked, answered the, every question I could ask within 20 or 30 minutes before she, she decided to leave. And But one of the questions, the abduct people, the creatures who abducted her were greys. And I asked her about whether they were ever going to do what David Jacobs and <laughs> whether they were going to replace us, right? Uh -huh. And she said, yes, that actually he's correct. That's why they're here. That's why they're getting our genetics because they want to populate the earth in the future. Yes. But it wasn't like David Jacobs states. It's not quite, he's correct, but he's not correct. He's both wrong and right at the same time. Okay. So if you listen, there's a, a guy I actually listened to today. I've heard him before. Uh, I'm trying to think of his name. Anyway, it's not important. Um, he made a, this other fellow made a statement one time that at some point humans start leaving the planet in mass to where there's very few humans left on the planet. We've all left, not because of any disaster or asteroids or pandemic or anything. We left because we decided we finally made contact with the larger group of beings that are living in the universe. And we have now the ability to go anywhere we want because we're all friends with all those beings. And everybody decided to leave because there's a lot of nice places out there. And so that's what the guy says. And not exactly in those words, but basically the same thing. So if there's a book called um, Mass Dreams of the Future, have you read it? It's written by uh, uh, um, I can't remember the guy's name at the moment, but there's there's two authors. Anyway, he he took him and his partner took um, thousands of people to the future, progressed them to the future, and uh, to different different uh, different uh, years, like 2050. 2080, whatever. And they did it like hundreds of people together. They would they would have they would go into a town and they would have uh, like stop smoking, $20 to stop smoking, and 100 people would show up and they would take them all to the future in mass. And then when they're out, they would make them write down what happened in this year, what happened in this year, what happened in this year. They had this questionnaire and stuff and they would get them to write it all down. And if you read the book, you'll find out that everybody states that in the future, there's like 1% uh, or 10% of the popu current population, no more than 10%, 1% to 10% on the earth going forward after, I don't know what year it starts or how, it, there's, there's no place in the book that tells you how we get like that. It doesn't say we leave or there was disaster or whatever. There's no way to know how we get from this population down to 
one to ten percent. And so uh, you don't know. And I was speculating all kinds of negative things until I heard this other guy mention that we were we all leave. And so anyway, according to the girl that I was sitting with at the UFO at the MUFON uh, meeting, where she and I are the only ones that show up. And she says, yes, they are going to replace us, but it's not um, it's not us. It's not our children. It's not our children's children. It's not our children. You know, it's like five or six generations down the road. We don't even know the people that that are on the earth at that time aren't alive yet. OK, their their parents aren't even alive yet. OK, so this is way down the road and there's very few people on the earth. And so they're not really replacing anybody. They're just repopulating the planet because there's very few people on the planet at the time. So it's not like David Jacobs thinks. It's totally different, even though he's sort of right, he's mostly wrong. So that's what she said. And that's one race. And that's an agenda of a single race out of a multitude of, of probably an infinite number of races that are out there. And probably quite a few that are coming to this planet. But um, I don't want to get into who's coming to this planet because I don't want to dominate this conversation. But I've done that too much already. So um, anyway. Yeah, I think also to go back, I mean, I I have friends and colleagues who, for example, say that the reptilians are, you know, negative, horrible, hideous, you know, evil, whatever. But I have other friends who say no. They they are very kind. They are you know generous enough. They have been their teachers. You know stuff like that. Um, you can get all kinds of conflicting stories about grays too. Some of some people and I know I've got uh, friends and colleagues who have literally been afraid to go to sleep at night because of their very graphic. Uh, abduction experiences. Um, and then I got others who went through maybe even similar or identical types of really weird, horrible, painful procedures who came out with almost, uh, I'm not, I always thought maybe it was a little bit of a, like a Stockholm syndrome thing where they, they're loving and, and appreciative of the greys and figure the greys got their own agenda going. But greys themselves, people, I know people who have touched them, who have physically, who have uh, attempted to co communicate on different levels. Uh, you've got some people who believe that they are actual, you know, species. And you've got others who believe that they're, you know, sort of bioandroids. Um, so, I mean, w forget about agendas. We don't even know what they are. Well, the... the um... The guy I listened to today that I've heard three times, he said that, and he's in direct contact with them all the time, according to him. He said there's like 63 or 65 gray races. And there are other people who talk about, when I say gray, I don't mean um, color of gray, I mean look similar that we call grays, even though they could be white or blue gray or any number of colors. But um, the girl that I interviewed in my last, if you want to hear another gray story, listen to my most recent interview. The lady, um, she's probably the most interesting person I've ever interviewed so far. And I've interviewed some, I've interviewed some very interesting people. And she would get molested by her, I don't know if it was her dad or uncle. One of, uh, it's probably her dad, but I, I really don't know. Uh, somebody in her family was molesting her as a young child. And the grays would, they were blue gray in color. And they would come and they would freeze her dad as he was molesting her and take her away while he's frozen and save her and and get her out of that experience and so they were very positive to her and they proved it by their actions so um i i uh, i've been working on a book 
since my first close encounter on October 3rd, 1980. And that's been quite, that's quite a long ways back. That's 42 years ago. And I could print it anytime I wanted, but um, I'm always polishing little nooks and crannies here and there, adding a quote, this and that. And, but in the end, I'd really like to have the aliens write it for me. You know, I want the, I don't want to say they're all bad or they're all good. I don't want to color the, the facts in any direction other than the truth. So I guess I, I really would like to get uh, some firsthand experience of a positive nature. I want somebody to prove to me they're positive before writing anything bad about them. Uh, you know, how, how could I say all blacks are this way, all whites are that way, all Hispanics are this way, all humans are X, Y, or Z, or all grays of any of the 65 races. Let's say the guy tells the truth just for the sake of argument. Uh, how could I say any one of those races is all good or bad when I can't say my own race is all good or bad? You know, so I, I always feel like I don't have enough information to to write in a book about anything unless it's direct firsthand information. It, you know, it, it, I've quoted Lynn Buchanan in my book, like a whole page just for him. And, uh, you know, I can do that because I think he actually gave me permission a long time ago, but I'll ask again if we ever have our things so that he forgives me. You know, I have him on, on film, on video. <laughs> it says, yes, you can quote me extensively so i want to put that all that stuff in there that he talks about i think we were actually talking a long time ago and he actually um uh, i think i took it off a of video that he put out and uh, and then i actually got permission from him way back when but i don't have any proof of that at this point but um he's probably right you know um but even with the details he's putting in there, it's still an unbelievably vague picture. You know, there's so many pieces. It's like a billion or trillion piece puzzle, and you've got you've got a hundred million pieces, but it's there's a trillion pieces, and you've only got a hundred million. You know, it's nothing, and uh, it's not even ten percent. So yeah. Um, anyway, give us. I think you got to go with. Uh... You have to stop thinking. It's a little bit what you got to do when you're remote viewing, but it's more of a, um, well, I guess the closest thing you could call would be channeled type of uh, experience of simply stating what flows through you and assume that that's genuine and authentic. Well, I've, um, I was in a, I was doing a uh, an anger management class, a six month anger management class because of some problems with me and my wife, and it would it was held in a church, and we would sit in a circle and talk. You know, every person was expected to talk, and uh, there's this one fellow that I noticed who was hanging his head down a lot. And at some point, in, I started talking about this fellow, and I started telling him things about himself that I did not know. And I know it was coming from my higher self. I wasn't channeling a foreign being. That was my higher self talking. So it's only happened once that I remember for sure. And uh, But it's interesting when your higher self starts speaking through you, and you you know, and it's stuff that you don't know consciously, and you know you don't know it consciously at the moment you're saying it. That's kind of interesting. It doesn't happen all the time. But uh, anyway, let's get back on you. Um, what would you like to talk about now? Do you have more alien experiences, or do you have near-death experiences? What do you have? If I asked you to go to any experience that you've ever had, it's more in, at least as interesting as anything you've talked about, but you haven't talked about it. What would that be? 
I have no idea. I have no idea. I mean, I I don't view myself as so much interesting. Unique. Is not that interesting, huh? Oh, you're very interesting. Come on. Uh, more, you got more alien stuff. I, I think the other, the other. Well, yeah. I mean, I see stuff. I mean, I I've seen many, many, many craft. I I usually up until the last couple of years, which has been a bit of a dry spell until just a few weeks ago. Um, I mean, I just look up in the sky. I could see craft all the time. So, uh, and I see stuff frequently that other people who are experiencers and who do this, you know, they do CE5s all the time. They go out looking for UFOs, whatever. And they see, I see stuff that other people don't see. That's not unusual for me. Um, and I don't know what the stuff is. I, I, I don't know what to make of it. I, I mean, nothing is coming with, you know, uh, some, you don't get instructions with any of this stuff and they're not coming with banners and signs and, you know, uh, I, I don't know why I see stuff. Um, I don't know why other people cannot see it. I don't really get it. Other than I know that that is part of the manipulation that's done with the human race. Um, and so... You know, it's very much the what, what finally Jacques Vallée got around to kind of saying, you know, um, it's a it's a way to it's a way to make us see things and experience things. Some of us. I kept thinking originally that if I could just wake up enough people that they could also then you know, see stuff and experience stuff. And I'm not so sure that it works that way. I mean, I've got a friend who uh, he was abducted with uh, another woman many years ago uh, in uh, um, New York State. And he has talked about a story where he was driving with uh, a friend. There was a male friend driving, a female sitting in between them. And then he was sitting, they were all sitting in the front, the, you know, in the passenger uh, except for the driver. And so he and the woman both see right in front of them on the road, up above, there's a huge craft. And it's full of lights and whatever. And so he's all excited. Do you see it? Do you see it? And the woman says, oh, that's amazing. That's incredible. And the driver says, where, where, where? And he's looking right at it. I just had an experience um, uh, a couple of weeks ago um, I'm in Connecticut, and uh, we live in a very rural part of the country, uh, part of the state. And uh, I was driving. My husband was sitting in the passenger seat in the front, and uh, I turned the car, and I look up because I am my eye sees an explosion of white light, and I'm thinking to myself. My first thought was, "Who the hell?" is lighting off uh, like commercial fireworks in the middle of nowhere. And I know that all that area back there is a, it's a land trust in a state park. There's no, nothing back there, nothing. And uh, it's all woods and swamp or marshes as they say here. And um, there was just one little farmhouse right in front. And this was literally in its backyard. And this white flash goes off. It's huge. You can't miss it. It lights up everything. And it goes flying upward and then horizontally, just right above the tree line in the backyard. And it has about a, I would say, a 20-foot brilliant white trail of like a comet tail of light. I've seen these before. I've seen smaller ones in all over the place. Other people very, you know, good ufologists and experiencers, and they can't see them. And I'm saying, but it's clear as day. And these things are so brilliant when they go off. It's nothing to do with my vision, that I know. And I can track them. And I can measure them. I'm really good with space. I can measure space and time really well. And uh, I don't understand. That's part of the phenomenon. Whatever it is, uh, there are people just like people being switched into animated or, or suspended animation while others are kept 
lively. Uh, you know, we're also manipulated as to what we get to experience. So did you read um, The Mothman Prophecy? Oh, sure. So are you aware of the parts he left out of the book? Uh, I'm not, I, I, well, let me, let me put you this one. You saw the movie that goes the, of the same I, name. I saw the movie. I've read the books. I okay. read a lot of John Keel stuff. Okay. So you read the eighth tower? Uh, it's mm, a book he wrote not. after the, uh, hold on a second. <sighs> Doesn't want, oh, there we go. The itch up. No, uh, I don't think I read that. No, I don't think so. Let's see. Darn it, Mo. Oh, there we, there we go. All right. So, uh, yeah, I, I see it. I get it. All right. Um, I th he, this is, Feels like a continuation of the Mothman prophecies, but anyway, um, there's a there's a, a recording on YouTube that I've seen or heard. It's actually just audio. There's no video with it. It's just an audio recording on YouTube, and um, and it was actually the recording was made before the Mothman was ever seen. It was it was in the same area as the silver bridge but it was uh, it predates the first sighting of the mothman by a fairly short period of time but it was right around that same time frame but before mothman was ever seen okay and yeah. but if you go listen to it this guy's driving down the highway and um, this is almost like Coast Encounters of the Third Kind, where the guy's in his truck and the thing comes up behind him. But this thing is like, it's like he thinks it's an automobile, right? It comes up behind him and then it goes around him and it's, it's flying uh, as if it's a car with no wheels. It's very mm -hmm. close to the ground and it goes in front of him and turns sideways and slows down and forces him to a stop. And then it opens the door on the side and the alien steps out and walks around the car to his window and goes over and knocks on the window. And this is a, this is, you can still listen to it. It's probably still on YouTube. Uh, and uh, this is an alien encounter in the same area as the Mothman with the Silver Bridge, that same exact area. And it pre it's just prior to the Mothman ever being seen. So the aliens actually appear before the Mothman does. Mm -hmm. And that was Kiel's, uh, he said, he says in his book, I've interviewed more contactees than anybody yes. alive. Yeah. And he says, if you've seen Anybody who's seen any alien craft up in the sky will start having paranormal stuff happen in their house. Mm -hmm. So he connects the paranormal with aliens. Right. The first person that does it. The leg is, you know, doing the same thing. But um, in the Eighth Tower, uh, what he does is he takes it to another level. He says... Uh, I've, you know, what is, how does he say it? He says, I've seen people that were out in a field saying, you know, you know, come and get me or something. I'm not sure what they were saying. The aliens come down and they see them and everything. And these people are the, he's saying in the book that these people are creating or somehow it, it's, manifesting as aliens if it were demons or angels or ghosts or whatever what he's saying is we are causing these manifestations to occur 
as they occur because of our own thoughts and how we how we are as an individual. So each, uh, I think that, uh, uh, what's the guy, the psychiatrist, uh, I can't remember which college he was from. There's a famous UFO psychiatrist way back in the early days. And he made the point that people's, the aliens craft that appear to individuals not, are not just aliens appearing. They're actually appearing to give the person something they needed based on their own psychology. And this is Valet and Kiel are all, and this other guy, other psychiatrist, I can't think of his name off the top of my head. Uh, I'll think of it here in a moment. Uh, they're all saying the same thing uh, in a different way. Uh, Kiel is saying, that we're, our consciousness is basically taking the vast whatever, the, the um, oh, I don't have the book with me, the, uh, what do they call it? The Akasha, the, the, the vast Akashic field. We're taking that field and manifesting different things in our vicinity based on our, who we are. We're actually manifesting these things in the sense that, you know, if you want a, if we believe in aliens, that's what's going to show up. If we believe in demons, that's what's going to show up. If we believe in angels, that's what's going to show up. It's not necessarily that we're creating them. It's just that the the Kashic field is changing into whatever based on what we believe in. And it's it's I don't know that I agree with it because it's it's sort of so vague. In the sense that it's like saying nothing exists in the universe until we until we have a it's like you look at a uh, a part you look at a particle it's either a particle or a wave it's what it becomes either the particle or the wave depends on who's observing it right mm -hmm. well that's what Valet and Kiel and this other guy are all saying is that begin depending on the observer. What manifests is unique for that individual, and that's yeah. a little bit the the theory about you know if you look at the really ancient reports of like in China seeing the, a dragon in the sky, or in medieval times seeing you know a, a ship or a chariot with horses. That in other words, working so the people saw whatever they were working with with their own technology of the times. Versus, you know, what we see today, which would be a, like a, you know, a spaceship, a, a craft or something. Or if you, well, if you look at what uh, in the Bible, when Ezekiel is talking about the, the spinning wheels, you know, that's what he saw. You see what you anticipate seeing. I've written about that at length in my book, Psychic Intuition. Okay. People do see that. However, I do think there's another piece to that, which is that, for example, when uh, my my daughter and I had our uh, sighting in 2011, we walked out of the movie theater. I did not believe in ETs or UFOs. I didn't believe in them. They weren't particularly part of my, you know, I wasn't looking to shape something. Um, right. I didn't believe in those. In fact, I probably would have believed in seeing an angel more than an ET. Okay. But that's, you know, that's not what I've experienced. Well, I think there's a whole other phenomenon that goes on, which is once something enters the current, you know, not just the overall Akashic records or the collective uh, consciousness or unconsciousness uh, in, in the more sort of Jungian sense of it, it's pre-existing. You also have then what happens in society where, you know, I don't know if you've spoken with Whitley Strieber. I've been interviewed by him on his show. Um, but, you know. I've spoken to him in person, but not uh, not at length. Go ahead. Okay. And, and what, he, what he basically is saying that, you know, none of this stuff with the, the grays, with the, the big almond eyes even existed prior to um, his book coming out with that on the cover. And all of a sudden you have tons of people saying, oh yeah, that's what I saw, that's what I saw. So, you know, humans have this, uh, 
they're they're very influenced by each other and and by you know what's trendy, what's a buzzword, what's going to make you cool or special or whatever. And then you get a whole lot of people who are and I you know and they're generally they're sweet, they're well-meaning or whatever, but they're they're wannabes. You know, they want to be special. Oh yeah, I saw that. I saw a whole lot of that. You know, plus I saw this and that, and you know, I have daily whatever. Uh, maybe, maybe not. Um, I find a lot of that. You know, I, I I analyze that on a much more psychological basis. Let me put it that way. Well, I was certainly not thinking about aliens the night of my first encounter. I was, I was thinking about leaving the planet, and I do believe that's why they came because I was ready to kill myself or not ready to kill myself. I was thinking about killing myself. I I don't know that I would ever actually have done it, but I was thinking about leaving the planet in one fashion or another. But I, I aliens, even when I saw what I saw in my head, even then I didn't think about aliens. Even after I actually saw the craft in the middle of my head, I still did not think about aliens even then. And, uh, and, after I stepped out of my car and looked up at this thing, the first thing uh, that came to my mind was, uh, it, I, I didn't believe it was real. I thought it was a hallucination. That's the first thing that came to my mind was, oh, you're just a hallucination. I, you're not real. You don't, you don't exist. And, uh, and so what I did was, I turned around, rolled up the window in my car, locked the door, got into my car on my knees, inched over to the other side of the car, rolled up that window, locked that door, moved back on my knees, looked over at the digital clock that said 1100, October 3rd, 1980, 11 o'clock exactly, inched backwards out of the car, stepped back, closed the door, turned around and expected this thing to be gone because I still believed it was a hallucination. I looked up and it's still sitting there. So, and then from there, it's a very long encounter, but, but at that point, I'm like, oh, you're real. I didn't, at that point, I didn't, no longer believed it was a hallucination. I believed it was real. And so, um, you know, and it goes on, but, the point is, is that I wasn't thinking about aliens, and there, I know that there are some families who've been abducted, where the whole family gets abducted at the same time, and one of the kids ends up killing themselves because they can't handle the abduction experience. Okay, and obviously that kid was not expecting to see aliens. It freaked him out. It was beyond his. Uh, capability to handle mentally. He didn't go crazy. He just ended his life because he couldn't handle the, what he experienced. He wasn't hallucinating, nor was he making something up. Um, so, anyway, I you know I think I find that to be very similar. Uh, well, okay. So, so you you've encountered spirits of humans who've passed, right? I've encountered disincarnate forces my whole life. Whether what they were is remains to be seen. But go ahead. Okay. There's a particular sensation that I get when I am near spirits, and. I've only been able to describe it like, um, you know, it's a little bit like you were trying to describe what was that incredible, loud, thunderous noise in your living room. Yeah. Versus like a little knocking noise, you know, on your ceiling. And, and yeah. you were trying to, yeah, you were trying to distinguish between that. And for me, the way I interpreted that, when I'm around spirit, I feel like it's like, Trying, it's like trying to have your senses, but they're underwater. And there is a strange, it's like you hear something, 
but it has that underwater sort of auditory sound, which means it's not 100%, let's say, real, okay? But it's not unreal either. It's somewhere in that kind of never-never land of, of stuff, you know, that which is why I get annoyed with people who only will think in black and white terms. You know, it's either this or that, you know, zero or a hundred, but nothing in between. And, and reality is so rich in that kind of sub reality space. It's still real, but it, it exists in a place where it's really hard to distinguish between what you expect and what you know and what you want and what simply appears. Um, have you ever had much experience with the hypnagogic or hypnopopic states? Um, uh, yeah. Okay, sure. so <laughs> have you ever noticed your dreams starting with um, like a little bitty image, you know, you're 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 trying, you're falling asleep, and you're looking in your mind's eye, and you see a little, like an image, that's like a square, and it's vaguely there, and it's moving at you, and you know, if you don't come out of that. Um, what, what's happening is you're about to go into a dream. That's a dream coming at you. Have you ever, have you ever had that experience? No, I go, I drop through layers, I, but I don't have an imagery like that, no. Okay, so um, there is a, I've actually read probably pretty much zero about hypnagogy or hypnopompic states, and they are, weirder than aliens they um they occur exactly okay so most people don't understand first of all that your your dream state starts when you're halfway between awake and asleep you're still half awake you're half awake half asleep that's when dreaming starts and dreaming ends at that same spot coming out you're half awake and half asleep that's when your dreaming ends that's the mm -hmm. only way you can remember your dream okay mm -hmm. well there is a state between awake and asleep that is not a dream state, nor is it a regular mind state. I don't know if it's an astral realm or I don't know what it is, but it's a hypnagogic, you can call it a hypnagogic or hypnopompic state where it it's so rare to, to, to experience it. Because you're so close to sleep when you, when you can see it. And you only get little glimpses of it, like just flashes. And I've never heard anybody write about it where, you know, where they understand it at all. And uh, do you write about that in your books at all? In any of your books? Have you ever, tell me if any, if you've had any hypnopompic or hypnagogic experience, state experiences. Of any kind. Well, all I can say is, and, and I don't know what you mean by experiences. I mean, that's sort of my experience. I follow, I track myself. Yes. I'm really good at it. And I have, I, one of the things that I teach my uh, TSP remote viewing uh, students about is how to track their really, uh, nonsensical experiences that they get when they're wandering into psychic realms, which is somewhat of a trance state. It's a light trance state. And and being in that sort of uh, hypnagogic type of a state, or it's, um, I track myself and I can feel myself if, if I hear, for example, I have a couple of cats, one of them makes a meowing noise. I, I'll wake up at the drop of a pin. I'm a very, very light sleeper. And I know exactly, you know, at what stage I am in terms of the sleep process and also coming out of it. But if I hear something, 
I'll feel myself getting bumped up through different layers, levels of, of consciousness. I can track my imagery as I'm falling asleep. Um, I know that I'm falling asleep. I've been a lucid dreamer since I was a little kid. Um, I've only so, had maybe six of them in my whole life. Oh, oh, okay, yeah. Um, most very, of my dreams, very short. Well, I only had one persistent one, and that's a that's an interesting one. But go ahead. No, if they're persistent, that those are usually the most interesting. Yes. Well, the reason why I say it is because it wasn't a lucid dream in the in the sense that you would call it. It wasn't. I call it a lucid dream, but the one dream that was the most amazing dream of my life wasn't a lucid dream. It was lucid and it was a dream, but it wasn't a lucid dream. It's kind of hard to explain, but um, I know what a lucid dream is. It's when you wake up inside your dream and you realize you're dreaming. And in that sense, it was a lucid dream, but it wasn't a dream in the sense that my mind was making it up. It was an experience either on the astral realm or somewhere. It was a real experience, not a mind created experience. And um, basically what happened, it's very short. What happened was I was seeing, um, I was seeing a light and the light was, um, it was taking up most of my field of my vision. It was actually outside of me, but it was taking up basically all the space in front of me. And it was a vertical light. And it was, it's hard for me to describe the light because I don't remember if it was, it wasn't dim and it wasn't bright. It was somewhere in the middle. And, um, but I got, um, the only other thing I could see besides the light was a shadow. And the shadow was at the base of the light at the bottom. And the shadow was going back and forth, left to right, light to left. It was kept going back and forth, back and forth. And, you know, I'm in the dream and I'm seeing this light. And I'm seeing the shadow go back and forth uh, at the bottom of the light. And I'm thinking, what is this I'm looking at? And I'm like, and then instantly I had the answer of what it was I was looking at. It was the spirit of my first dog. Um, his name was Chigger, and he was a Chihuahua or a uh, Dachshund. He was a Dachshund, and uh, and um, he ended up burning up in a fire. And oh. uh, anyway, uh, that was his spirit, and I got this huge amount of love from this uh, pet that I had as a young boy. And it came back to give me that love in that dream. But it wasn't, a, you know, my mind wasn't making this up. It wasn't the creation of my mind. And, uh, but I realized it was, I was dreaming at the time. And, and I knew as soon as I realized what it was, that it wasn't a normal dream. So that, that was my most amazing dream. Have you had any? Uh, really, really interesting dreams. Of course, I, 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 I get. I have really great dreams. I, I, they're, the older I've gotten, the more complex and the more interesting they are. I really enjoy them much more now than I used to. Um, what I was going to say was that um, I do think that was probably real, and if you're, that was the way your mind made the association. You know, you didn't necessarily put the image. Oh, by the way, it's aphantasia. That's the name of the condition. Is that what you yeah. have? Yeah. Right. And, um, but I've had, um, <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I've had um, cats. I believe it was my, I've had many cats in my life. One of my cats that passed uh, walk on my bed and I thought it was my living cat except my living cat was curled up between my knees and this other phantom cat was literally walking 
uh, across the bed and then walked across my legs. Um, so, I mean, I, I think that's the same thing, essentially, as what you had, just a different format. I, I uh, have some other um, uh, former students of mine who um, they they had this beautiful dog. I don't know if it was like St. Bernard or something. It was a puppy and it, it died. Um, but in the morning, uh, and they would make their bed like perfectly, you know, the, the quilt or the cover was perfect, no wrinkles, no nothing. And they would walk in and they would find the dog's, uh, paw prints or imprints, I should say, in the blanket walking across. So, I mean, I think that they show up. Which, by the way, you're asking about interesting experience. I'll give you one more. So uh, because I never subscribed really to the Sylvia Brown, um, you know, thing of she, she was always so proud of the fact she'd have like a crowd of dead people at the end of her bed every night. And they all want to communicate with her because she was a medium. I never thought that was a good idea. Frankly, I go to my bed. I want to go to sleep. I don't want dead people. And um, <laughs> so... And I don't, you know, I don't want anything, you know, nothing in there. I just want to be able to sleep. So I uh, uh, sort of created a, uh, a perimeter, I guess, of the bedroom. And I, I've had plenty of spirits that you can, in your physical senses, can sense. All right. I've had them in houses where I've lived. I definitely, I said, you know what, guys, you want to walk around anywhere else in the house. You're welcome to it. That's fine. But I don't want you in the bedroom. I set up this sort of a perimeter that's rule based, which is, you know, nobody gets to come in. That's it. Not in my bedroom. And um, I. I only had one breach ever. I never understood it. It was the weirdest damn thing. Um, other than the, the cats who I, I realized I'd forgotten to include in that group animal spirits but anyway so so this um whatever it was i was asleep i was on my side and i don't know why i woke up but i suddenly flipped my eyes open and in front of me was something that um i could only really sort of compare to like a sort of like a cousin it you know from the was it the adams family the monsters one of those yeah um you know, short, maybe three and a half feet tall or so. Um, no particular facial anything. I don't remember. I just remember it was brown. And I, the, the most striking thing was that, because uh, I didn't know what the heck it was, I had an instantaneous sense of abject terror and doom, not like anything I've ever had in my life. I don't know what it was. I've never seen anything like it before or since. Um, the terror was so intense. And I'm not a person who gets, I don't get frightened by stuff. Um, and particularly in the paranormal world. I just, I've, I've seen too many things. I don't get spooked by stuff. I just don't. And whatever this was, it's almost like the emotion of absolute terror had nothing to do with me. It was somehow implanted, and I don't know how they, whatever this was, did that, but I immediately started praying like crazy. I was praying, and, and I prayed enough, and poof, this thing disappeared. But that, that was the only thing that ever managed to um, get into my, my bedroom. So did you see it? How did you know it was there? Yeah, and I don't know whether I saw it. You know, that's what I'm talking about, that feeling of different layers of reality. There are layers of reality where you absolutely see things, um, but you don't know if you've seen it with your mind or if you've seen it. And I, I've never had a hallucination in my life. Um, you don't know whether you, you're seeing it with your mind, seeing it with your eyes, or some way half, half in between. It right. sort of feels like half between. Right. And it's very, very hard to explain those things to anybody because we all live in a consensus reality, which is, as I've written about, the lowest common denom denominator of, of reality. 
you know? So one time I was uh, laying in bed, I sat up 45 degree angle and I couldn't lift myself any further up. And um, I started freaking out. I started screaming because it scared the crap out of me. And after it was all over, I realized that I had gotten halfway out of my body. I just sat up halfway mm-hmm. out and, mm-hmm. and couldn't get all the way out and didn't know what was going on. Mm-hmm. And, and it scared me. So uh, I, that's a prelude to my next question, which is uh, out-of-body experiences or astral travel. Uh, um, when you remote view, I assume, you know, if you talk to McMonagall or um, the more talented remote viewers they kind of actually go somewhere and they split their con they either totally like um did did you ever read a book um called the music of the spheres uh i don't know whether i've just you know read about the music of, of the spheres or whether i read a book with that title i don't recall well there was a book uh in, you remember Ingo Swan, right? So, he was he was my mentor. Okay, you you knew him. You know him. Sorry. You him. Yeah, I did. Yeah, for ten years. Okay. So, um, he went astral traveling or out of body with um, a psychic uh, with the name of. Um, Oh, God, what was his name? Uh, I can't remember the guy's name off the top of my head. Anyway, the psychic wrote a book called the music, NAD colon space, the music, of, music of the Spheres. And I had had um, that phenomena come on in me several times when I was sitting on my couch in a particular apartment I had. Anyway, I went to the library, I was looking around for information, and I saw this book and read it, and I'm not sure why I've lost my train of thought. Uh, okay, oh yeah, Ingo and him went to Mercury and some other, pl- Jupiter or somewhere, and they, out of body, and they, they, uh, they noticed, they wrote down and describe what they were seeing at the at this particular planet they were at, whether it was Mercury or one of the other planets. I think I can't remember which planet it was, but it, that's another story. Anyway, you can go look it up. But they, Ingo no, I, don't, and, I don't need to because I know what he was doing. Right. Okay. So um, that was before our probes went to to that planet. You, you, and then, you're thinking of uh, you're thinking of Jupiter, which is he remote viewed. These are remote viewing things that he was doing. Now there was a big argument in the remote viewing field as to whether you know that involves an out of body or not. You know that's a whole esoteric discussion. But what he he was remote viewing and what he did was uh, he remote viewed it and. Um, it was, I think that was around 1973-ish, and they didn't really discover, maybe it was 74, they didn't have feedback from any one of the orbiters until, ni- I think it was 1979, and it came back and it verified a lot of his stuff. He was really proud of that. Um, he also did his famous um, uh, viewing of the, if you read Penetration, the, the uh, Dark Side of the Moon. Yes. Okay. Uh, so there was that, and he, I mean, he he did some of the others, but n- not nearly as famous as that. Well, the guy that did that with him, they did it as a, as a pair, and the guy who did it with him wrote the book NAD Music of the Spheres. And um, he, are you talking about his monitor? No. So he he they did it as a pair. They did they went and checked this out, place out. Um, 
you can look at it, Google it right now if you want it and get the guy's name. But uh, I, prob I probably know them. Well, I, I don't know. They're not, this guy's not, uh, he's not one of our remote viewers. He's just a psychic. He was never part of any of the remote viewing. He was a guy out in the Midwest. I'm not sure where he was, but I can tell you he was never part of, he was not like Pat Price or, or uh, you know, the car salesman or uh, Joe Monago or Len Buchanan. He was never part of the remote viewing program ever. He, he did this. They did this. As far as I'm, um, I don't know if this was even part of the remote viewing program when they did it. I suspect it was something separate from that. If it's the one I'm thinking of, it was separate and it was done by mail. Yeah, well, all I know is the guy, the psychic who did it with him, wrote the book, Music of the Spheres. And uh, I don't even know why I brought all that up. There was a reason why I brought all that up. It had to do with something you said. Oh, no, it had to do with the question I was going to ask you was, out of body experiences, you know, have you done astral traveling or out of body experiences? Have you done, have you gotten into those areas? That was my. I did. I tell everything I just said was a prelude to the question. Here's the question. <laughs> um, people ask me that, and I've always said, as far as I know, I don't haven't had out of body experiences. Now, when I start telling people about my experiences, I can't tell you how many people say, oh yeah, that's an out of body experience. Well, if it is, I think we all have different definitions. Um, I once said, cause I was so confused about it. I said to Ingo, I, uh, I said, you know, I had this dream about you like the night before. And I, I, I fly a lot in my dreams. I fly in most of my dreams sure. and I, I discovered like early on that uh, I remember reading some, you know, psychology book or something like when I was a kid, if you dream about flying, it's some type of sexual immaturity. So I always kind of chalked it off for that. <laughs> but, um, you know, I do fly a lot in my dreams and the, my flying has gotten way better. Um, so I was flying in my dream. I was, I flew across New York city I flew through the buildings, uh, the you know the tall buildings, in order because I was on my way to visit Ingo, and he lived uh, down the Lower East Side. And so I saw him down there, like a day or two later, and I said, you know, I'm very confused about out of body experiences. So I had this this you know it's a fairly lucid type dream, and this is what I did, and I was flying through buildings and stuff and i said is that out of body and he said yes now i don't know that that was out of body i know people who are instantly and and many times involuntarily transported into a complete alternate reality and that's not what i was doing so uh you know and i have uh yeah i got plenty of other plenty of other dreams that people think yeah but i don't know i mean it's not i know that when i've talked to many people about it usually they they understand where their entry and exit points are out of their body they know the the feeling of of you know levitating or whatever um i can imagine i have a great imagination i can imagine almost anything so um i'm always concerned that i'll just be imagining something well, I look at a lot of that stuff, the dream world as the uh, the astral plane, okay? And I try to make a distinction between the astral plane and out of body, but I'm not sure that there is a, a, a really good distinction because, like, for instance, when Ingo went to Jupiter or Mercury, I remember it as Mercury. Now, I've read, you know, it's like different timelines, different stuff, you know. One timeline it was Mercury, one timeline is Jupiter. Anyway, the um, the him and the other psychic they went to the real planet and observed a real phenomenon that was verified by 
space probes. So we know that was the physical, the actual physical plane, not the astral plane, because it was verified by the probes. But if you hear people talk about um, they got out of their body, they went across town, they went to their buddy's house, they went into their buddy's house or apartment, woke their buddy up, and their buddy could see them in the apartment. Now, when the buddy sees them, we know that's the physical plane. But if you'll notice from the story, when they recount the story, that they'll say something like, uh, it all was like normal, except when I got to the door, the door was a little different from what I remember it. So at that point, that kind of gives you the idea they're moving in the astral plane. But when they wake up their buddy, obviously he's on the physical plane because he's still alive. So it's like you're moving through the astral plane and coming back to the physical plane and you're going back and forth between the two. And so it is rather confusing considering if the more you learn about it, the more you're not, not sure which it is. And I, we, you know, people like to say that the astral plane is memories of the physical plane. So it mirrors the physical plane, in, as in it looks very real, but your memories are not perfect. So it's being a memory is not going to be perfect either. It's going to be flawed in certain pieces or areas. Mm -hmm. So anyway. Makes sense. Makes sense, yeah. Yeah. So um, we're coming on three, or we actually past three hours. Are you tired yet? Yes. <laughs> There we go. Okay. So I guess we can end it here. And uh, uh, the obvious things I should ask you before we leave, I should first thank you for being on the show very much. First. Second, um, especially on such short notice. And second, uh, promote yourself in any fashion you'd like. We've already spoken about your two books uh how to speak to aliens speak a, a tiny bit more about that book because i i don't still don't know how to speak to aliens and if you think you know how